The Ancient History of the Septuagint, written in Greek by Aristides near two thousand years ago, being his voyage to Jerusalem as ambassador from Ptolemaeus Philadelphus unto Eleazar, then high priest of the Jews, concerning the first translation of the Holy Bible by the seventy-two interpreters, with many other remarkable circumstances nowhere else to be found. First Englished from the Greek by the learned and reverend Dr. John Dunn, late dean of St. Paul's, now revised and very much corrected from the original, London, printed for W. Hensman and Thomas Fox, booksellers in Westminster Hall, 1685, to the reader, although time and death, from our cradles to our graves, pursue us swiftly, and, according to the Almighty's ordinance, overtake and seize upon our frail and earthly parts, upon some sooner, upon others later. Yet excellent acts, like strong eagles, break from their seizure, and soar above them in so sublime a pitch, as neither time, with all his power and rusty powder, with which he blots and rubs out brass and marble, can quite obscure or extinguish them, neither death close in his dark gaping mouth, the grave, their nobleness. Witness this small, yet ancient history, which this last summer I made part of my exercise to put into an English habit, that the story is ancient, I may well say, for it is nineteen hundred years since Aristeus writ it to his brother Philocrates, which Aristeus, signed Hiram, in his epistle to the Pentateuch of the Bible, says, was Hyperaspistes to Ptolemius Philadelphus, king of Egypt, Syria, Phoenicia, and Cilicia, and son of Ptolemius Largus, one of the great captains of Alexander Magnus, that divided his conquests, the world, amongst them. This Ptolemius Philadelphus was a most accomplished young gentleman, virtuously disposed, and so great a lover of learning, as he had accumulated into his library, according to some authors, a thousand, eight hundred, zero, 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 zero volumes, printing being not then risen in our hemisphere, was by the said Aristeus, a most noble person, and a great friend of the then captive Jews, as an instrument of God, for the liberty and freedom of them, then his people, practised with Demetrius Phalerius, to tell the king, that his so abundant library was but poor, because it wanted the book of books, the sacred volume of God, which we call the Holy Bible. The king, virtuously covetous thereof, demanded how he should best acquire it. Aristeus, waiting this desired occasion, proportioned his advice, that he should first set all the captive Jews, not only in Egypt, but also in Syria, and see, at free liberty, and send ambassadors and presents to Eleazar, their high priest and pontiff. The king willingly consents thereto, as to the music of his desires, and prepares most rich presents, as a table of massy gold, embellished with precious stones, cups of gold and silver likewise adorned, sets at freedom the captive by public edict, and sends as ambassadors Aristeus and Andrea, prince and great captain of the guard of his person, with these gifts and divers talents of gold and silver. They go, deliver his letters of request and commends, have gracious entertainment, return with the seventy-two interpreters' Jews' letters, and also Eleazar's presents to the king, and in especial, with the sacred volume and word of God. The good king adores the books, feasts the bringers, who after fall to the business, and translated it out of the Hebrew into the Greek, the common learned language of those times, made famous by the sword of Alexander. And this in brief is the effect of this venerable history, which is by me thus made yours. And though I seem to anticipate thus to you, yet it is as nothing, for in itself, as you may further see, it is elaborately and eloquently written by the said Aristeus, and let no man wonder too much thereat, as thinking our times excel theirs in eloquence. No, for whoever exceeded Demosthenes the Greek, or Cicero the Latin, therein, lastly, to speak the praise of history, Libri sunt vasa memoriae, and worthy historical books have in them a kind of divine permanency, and as eminent persons should affect noble actions, so ought they to cherish the registers as their honourers. For hath not Plutarch made those giant heroes as Theseus, Romulus, Alexander, Julius Caesar, and the rest, yet live, and himself, 
more praisefully, longer than them all. So as an ignorant, swaggering fellow threatened his adversary to kill him if he had as many lives as Plutarch, did not Alexander sigh for another Homer? Lastly, if I have in honor of the history, like one holding a lighted taper to the clear noon shining sun, made an appendi, showing the antiquity and dignity of the books, by the said Septuagint translated, and the excellency of their inspired writer, Moses, and have therein been too prolixious, pardon, M, E, because of the profundity and worthiness of the matter, so I refer you to that, and the re, and so rest yours, John Donne, certain precognita, or characters of the chief persons mentioned in the ensuing history, one, of Ptolemus Philadelphus. Ptolemus, second of that name, surnamed Philadelphus, king of Egypt, of Phoenicia, and of Cyprus, son of the first Ptolemius, son of Largus, began his reign in the 271 year before the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. This Ptolemus Philadelphus was indoctrined in the science of good letters by Strabo the Peripatic, in which he became so excellent that he was esteemed one of the most accomplished princes of his time. But that which was in him the most admirable was the bounty, debonarity, sweetness, and gentleness of his spirit, accommodated with the manners and complexions of all worthy and deserving persons. By this means he entered so far, and before, in the grace of all the world, that everyone in his thought wished he were king. And his father, knowing his right of succession was to be so, and rejoicing in his hopes of him, made him to be crowned king, and divested himself of all authority, without reserving any power, right, or preeminence to himself, only a superintendency over the guard of the king his son, glorifying to be father of such a king, for the admiration he had of his high virtues, kindled and gave occasion between them both, of a most kind contention in mutual offices, the son yielding to the father, and the father to the son, in all, and by all, through instinct of devotion and piety, so they gave lively touches one to the other in all reducible fitting offices, which was cause that the people conceived a great fidelity and amity towards them, so as it seemed, even the divine providence prepared this noble spirit to introduce that great good amongst humanes, as to make them participants of the laws and divine illuminations wherewith God had favoured the people of the Jews above all the nations of the world. And it seemeth that even then his almightiness made a preparative for the vocation of the ethnics and Gentiles by communication so of his holy law, whereof Ptolemy was the ordained minister, to call the seventy interpreters into Egypt, to translate into the Greek language, which then was the most used and vulgar through the whole universe. So as I am amazed at some fanatical spirits that hinder us from the knowledge of God in not giving his word in the language of the people wheresoever, as is appertaining to everyone in regard of salvation, I would ask those men what language spake those dames of Rome, Paula, Eustochina, Melania, Susanna, Fabiola, Demetria, Furia, Flavia, Blasila, and others, for the institution of whom St. Hiram translated many books of holy scriptures out of strange tongues into Latin, which was the natural language of the said ladies. I would also know who was more wise or better inspired than St. Hiram. Further, it seems they either are or would seem to be ignorant of the institution of the Emperor Justinian, who ordained that those who sung in the temples, that they should sing high and so intelligible that all the people might understand them. But to return to Ptolemy, he undertook to erect a library in the capital city of his realm, Alexandria, the charge whereof he gave to Demetrius Valerius, a prince and an Athenian philosopher, who erected it so sumptuously that there was not the like in all the world, and it lasted until the first war of the Romans against the Alexandrians. This king had to wife Arsino, to whom he caused a statue to be raised, in height four cubits, of one entire stone called a topaz, the which had been given to Bernice the mother of Ptolemy, by a prince named Philemon. 2. Of Aristeus, the author of this history. Aristeus, the near kinsman and friend of King Ptolemy's Philadelphus, is named by St. Hierom Ptolemy Hyperaspistis, the shield of the king. Or he that defends the king with his shield, or bearer of the shield royal, 
which seems to me that he held some such place about the king his master, as we call at this day the great esquire of the king's body. He was the principal solicitor for the liberty of the Jews, that then were held slaves throughout all the dominions of Ptolemy, for he made the first request for them and obtained it. And for this cause he was sent ambassador with Andrea, prince of the guards belonging to the king, unto Jerusalem, to deal with the high priest Eleazar, who sent to the king Ptolemius six doctors of every tribe to go on with the translation and version of the holy books of Moses. He writ diligently his voyage, where he shows openly how and by what course those seventy-two interpreters behaved themselves in the said books. Some have been of opinion that they translated all the Bible, but it is more likely to many that they translated but the five books, that is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which they call the Pentateuch, which is the law of Moses, for Aristius speaks but of the law of Moses, and it is not likely that they touched the books historical, nor the prophets, for if it had been so, Aristius would not have been silent thereof. Moreover, that which they translated was finished in the space of seventy-two days, which is about two months and a half, and that's a time too small, and therefore impossible to translate all the Old Testament. Nevertheless, I am not ignorant that there was a turning of other books of the Bible that go by the name of the seventy-two interpreters, but I am persuaded that they were not then done in Egypt, unless that after they were returned to Jerusalem, they translated the rest of the holy books, although both in that and other opinions I submit me to the deliberation of the church from which I will not stray. But however, this translation was manifestly miraculous, which is sufficiently showed by that our Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles, in allegations of the law, use the version of these seventy-two interpreters. I have spoken these few words of Aristius, to the end the reader shall not think that this is that Aristius Proconensis, that could be invisible when he listed, making folks believe that he could die and rise again when he would, of whom speaks Swedes, Herodotus, Pliny, and Plutarch in the life of Romulus. 3. Of Eleazar the high priest of the Jews. Eleazar, of whom Aristeus makes mention, was brother of Simon, surnamed the Just. He, after the decease of his brother Simon, in the year of the reign of Ptolemy I of that name, 35, was made chief of the synagogue of the Jews, by reason that Onias, son of Simon his brother, was incapable of succeeding in his father's place as being under age. This Eleazar therefore received the honor that in his time the holy translation of the law was made by the seventy-two doctors that he sent to Ptolemyus, second of that name, king of Egypt, as Aristeus hath left by writing. 4. Of Demetrius Phalerius. Demetrius Phalerius was an Athenian orator and philosopher, as Cicero notes in the first book of his offices, calling him a subtil and sharp disputant, and in the rest, an orator little vehement. He had been disciple of Theophrastus. He was a man of such knowledge and excellent carriage that foreign kings had him in admiration and drew him to their service, even Cassander king of Macedon. And for this reputation the Athenians gave him the principality of the city and commonweal, in which he was ten years in great prosperity. But some of the citizens, having conceived malice against him, chased and threw him out of his estate, and then he was honorably received of King Ptolemy, of whom we speak, where he was master of the library royal. The Athenians, having formerly raised to him three hundred and sixty statues of marble, in despite cast them to the earth, and judged him to death as a traitor, of which Demetrius being advertised, said, The Athenians have thrown down my statues, but they cannot overturn my virtue, for which they first erected those statues. He was wont to say, that eloquence was as necessary in a common wheel as a sword in the wars. He died by the biting of an aspic, and was buried in the region of Busina, near to Diospolis. The history of Aristeus, ambassador of King Ptolemaeus Philadelphus, treating of his voyage unto Jerusalem, and the first translation of the Holy Bible by the seventy-two elders, written in Greek nineteen hundreds years since, Aristeus to his brother Philocrates, well knowing your natural and good inclination, Philocrates, to have always had in great esteem the knowledge of all things, and that you have been desirous, and even greedy to understand the occurrences and passages of good exploits, 
I have deliberated to frame to you in writing, a matter not only excellent in itself, but well deserving to be known, which unto us is happened, being sent of late to Eleazar, H., priest of the Jews. But because these things shall be more easy to you, I shall first declare the causes for which we were sent, and then I shall come to the progress of the matter, so as I shall shape my discourse to your understanding, and that the most truly I possibly can, as well or the dignity of the subject, as to delight your mind, desirous of all good knowledges, assuring myself that man hath in him nothing more excellent and laudable, than incessantly to desire learning, either by means of histories, or by the objects of things themselves, or by the course and experience of affairs. For the spirit of man, though rude and unfurnished, is greatly adorned and embellished, when from the beginning it delighteth to taste and relish those most nourishing, fair, worthy, and excellent things that may conduct him by an infallible course, to follow piety and right reason. We therefore searching with great curiosity into the knowledge of divine things, could not arrive at them, as not understanding the divine law, without being interpreted and rendered into our familiar tongue, for which cause we undertook to go ambassador to one only person, who amongst his fellow citizens and others, for frankness and great worth was in the most esteem, and who only did great honour and profit to the citizens, he conversed with, but also to all other Jews, of what other place, or whence soever, being then well informed, that they had the divine law written in Hebrew characters, in skins of parchment. We were joyful to accept this charge given us by the king, as also for that the colonies of the captive Jews here desired the same above all things of the world, who had been hither led by the king's father, that had reduced into his obedience the city of Jerusalem, and all the country adjacent. But since we are fallen to make mention of that matter, it will not be impertinent to give you light into the whole discourse, that thereby you may take your measures better, knowing well that it will be more advisable carefully to inform you how to address yourself to the service of God reverently, than to travel in the search of humane laws or actions, be they never so just, which inclination you have sufficiently manifested, since from an isle so far remote you are come to this country to see those things that may serve to the cultivating of your mind, without regard to any place whatsoever. I have therefore here reduced to writing, first, what hath seemed to me worthy of memory, touching the nation of the Jews, as I have in some measure understood from the learned and wise priests of Egypt, to the end that by this means I might aid and increase by some means your knowledge, for we ought to have in remembrance what good we have received from others, and particularly to show all gratitude to those who relate to us, and principally you, who have knowledge of virtue, deriving from your brother, not only resemblance, proximity of blood, and lineage, but those, those principles that excite you with the same impetuosity of courage, to attain the honour, glory, and beauty of virtue, assuring myself that neither the admiration of gold or riches, nor the appearance of any things more precious, conduce to anything but vain glory, neither will they yield you any such fruit as we may gather from knowledge, education, and consideration of good discipline. For the rest, to the end it may not seem that we make show of ostentation in being prolix in this preface, we will return to our purpose, from whence we have wandered. Demetrius Valerius, master of the king's library, after the best care he could, giving order to purchase books from all parts of the world, and employing for that purpose great numbers of persons, as factors, dispersed in many places, who had in charge to buy and transcribe them, they so doing, and that with diligence. The design of the king was accomplished and executed, at least in the best manner that was possible. For the king asking him, in our presence, how many thousand volumes he had collected for his library, he answered, for the present he had no more than two hundred thousand, and he hoped ever long to have to the number of five hundred thousand. But sir, said he, I have understood that the laws of the Jews deserve to be copied and translated, and to have place in your library, and what hinders it? answered the king, that they be not. Have you not all things to serve you convenient for that purpose? Demetrius answered, that it was necessary that those laws should be translated and interpreted, because the Jews had in use a character peculiar to their language, far different from the Egyptians, adjusting and accommodating their letters to the tone of the voice, 
and that they were much deceived. Who held they spake the Syrian tongue, for their manner of speech was far distant, to which the king replied, that he would write to the high priest of the Jews, to the end that all might be obtained which was requisite, to bring this matter to an issue, as Demetrius required. Then it came to my mind, that a fair opportunity presented for the freedom of all the Jews which his father Ptolemaeus Lagus had led captive from Judea into Egypt, for whose enlargement he had often entreated Susibius the Tarentine, and Andrea captain of the guard to the king's body. For these two commanding in the army had reduced to obedience all that were in Syria and Phoenicia, filling all those regions with fear and terror. And then were the Jews some of them led prisoners, others disposed in manner of colonies, in such numbers, as there were brought into Egypt to the number of one hundred thousand men, of whom were chosen well near thirty thousand effective, who were established as the guard of the province. True it is, before that time many had been sent with the Persians and other companies that were commanded against the K of Ethiopia under the leading of Semitica, but those that were there were not of so great number as those which were led away only by Ptolemus Largus. For, as we have said, he trained to arms all those whom age or ability showed to be proper, and all the rest of the people, as well children, as old men and women, he made use of for colonies, determining with himself that if at any time his men of war grew insolent because none could surpass them in course or necessity of war, he had means to check their presumption by such as might be drawn from these colonies. Now then, seeking an occasion to bring about the liberty of these poor men, as I have formerly said, and having found my opportunity, I opened my desire to the king, proposing after this manner, the proposition of Aristeus to King Ptolemus Philadelphus, for the delivery of the Jews. It is nothing strange, my gracious lord and sovereign, if many times it happen, that those very affairs which we manage thwart and run counter to our proceedings. For all the nations of the Jews have one and the same law, which we desire to be ours, not only copied, but also translated into the Greek tongue. How then expect you to succeed in this affair, when the greatest part of them are here in your kingdom kept prisoners? Unless it may please your august and generous spirit to request their holy books, after you have restored to free liberty those who live here in great calamity and pressure having before all things regard to that God who makes your kingdom flourish, and hath crowned you with great prosperity, which is the same God that hath given them that sacred law which we desire to have. For they worship that God who hath made and created all things, and is the very same, whose wonderful works all mankind see and admire, though some not so clearly as others, for, sir, we and others call him Jupiter, and not without reason, for it hath so seemed good to our ancestors, because by him are procreated and live all creatures. The same also they esteem the director and, and governor of the universe. And although he holds all mortals in subjection, nevertheless he neither frustrates nor disappoints the prayers and vows of those who, illuminated with spiritual light, implore his aid. We then ought humbly to desire that he would incline our hearts to such good resolutions as to do good, and that freely to every one and especially to deliver and free those that endure slavery and bondage, for that since mankind is the work and creation of God, who hath power to turn the heart and bend it which way it pleaseth him. We many times after different methods desire, it would please him to lead us to a perfection of goodness, as the principal ruler of all hearts and spirits. By this acknowledgment, I conceive great hopes to consummate this affair, principally because I know God to be favorable to those that pray for things reasonable and equitable. For when men set themselves wholly to seek and accomplish what hath a tendency to justice and perfection of goodness, God the Lord of all things conducts and addresseth their actions and affections to blessed and happy effects and ends. The king, then as something gained, with a contented countenance said to Andrea, How many are there of the Jews detained captive? He answered in few words, more than one hundred thousand. It is a small request, then said the king, Aristius requires of us, Sosibius and some others then there present answered. It is a thing, sir, worthy your grandeur and generosity, to make an agreeable present to God by their deliverance, in testification of your thanks and acknowledgment.
and since the governor of heaven and earth hath raised you to a greater height than all your predecessors, it is but just that you make thus a greater and more solemn expression of your thanks. The king then disposed to banqueting and pastimes in a full feast, and assembly of his nobles, commanded that the Jews should be all searched out, and that every man of them should be redeemed for the sum of twenty drachms by Paul, and to confirm the same, that his edicts should be issued, and that here in all the dispatch and readiness should be expressed that was possible. And so it seemed that God accomplished and brought to pass our desires, for he pleased to put it into the heart of the king to set at liberty, not only those that by the army of the king his father were led captive into Egypt, but also all others that before or since had been carried prisoners into Egypt. By what means soever, the sum then of those that were freed amounted to four hundred talents. Moreover, I hold it not beside my purpose to send you the copy and tenor of the edict, whereby you may understand the greatness of the attempt, and the frankness and gracious inclinations of the king, who hath been moved by the goodness of God for the salvation of many. The Edict of King Ptolemimus Philadelphus for the Delivery of the Jews. We will, and command all those that took up arms under our deceased father, through the country of Syria and Phoenicia, entering the land of Judea, and there taking the Jews and leading them prisoners, having imposed them their tasks and employments in town and country, that they shall deliver and restore them to full liberty. Moreover, we will that all the Jews that either before or since have been taken and led away, in what fashion or manner soever, shall be delivered frank and free, for the ransom we have set, that is to say, twenty drachms for every head, which sum the men of war shall receive from the fond of the staple and stores of victuals, and the rest shall be received from the allowance of the king's table, or be reserved. For we are duly informed that those Jews were appointed and led away prisoners against the will of our deceased father, and against right reason, and that by the boldness and insolence of the men of war they were carried into Egypt, and their country wasted and laid desolate, when it was sufficient to have the men of war of the said country under their power, and all the province reduced to obedience, intending then to do and render right to every one universally and especially to those who receive injury from the unjust power of others. Moreover, to search diligently and particularly into all things that concern right and equity, and to prefer piety and religion before all things, our will and pleasure is, that all Jews whatsoever, being bond and slaves within this realm, in what part soever they be found, be it in the colonies or elsewhere, or be it in whatsoever manner they were brought into our kingdom, shall be delivered, enfranchised, and set at liberty, for we are pleased it shall be so done, and to the end that no person shall be interested, or receive damage, we command that three days after the publication of this present edict, every one whom it doth concern shall bring before us their requests, containing the number of heads that every one hath set at liberty, for so it pleaseth us to have it, for the profit of us, and our kingdom, declaring further, that the goods of those who are not obedient to this our edict shall be forfeited and confiscate. And we give liberty to whosoever will, to accuse and inform against their contumacy or contempt of our will and pleasure. This edict being written, completed, and brought to the king, to know if his pleasure were it should be published in this manner, or that he would correct and so approve it. When he perceived that these words, viz., and those that before and since had been led prisoners, were wanting, he inserted them out of his goodness and bounty. He then made the of money presently to be doubled to his treasurer and officers of his finances, which distribution was dispatched in the space of seven days, and there was defrayed well near six hundred and sixty thousand talents, for there were found a great number of children with their mothers, who were all set at liberty, and for every head of theirs was paid by the king's command, twenty drachms, which was discharged by the king to his great content and satisfaction. After all was done, he commanded Demetrius, by course of estate, to deliver him the number of the Hebrew volumes. For with these kings it is in use to comprise all things in edicts, and to signify nothing, be it never so small a business, without writing, as well for greater state and ceremony, as also that belief may more certainly be given thereto. Therefore to the end you may, as it were, have all before your eyes, 
I will here insert the tenor and copy of the request made to the king by Demetrius, and the epistles which were sent for those that were franchised, so as you may see the number, and of what quality they were, and according to the trades and professions by which they were distinguished, and how they were registered and enrolled. The copy of Demetrius, his request to the king, was this, the request of Demetrius Philarius to the king Ptolemius Philadelphus, great sir, since it hath pleased you to give me command to search in all places for all manner of books, to replenish and adorn your library. I have thought it fit and necessary that we procure and get the books of the Jewish laws, and some others, that we are yet wanting and unfurnished of. And because the said books of the Jews are written in Hebrew characters, peculiar and best known to the Jews alone, and therefore not yet fall into your royal hands, nevertheless, that they may be gained and ranked amongst your other volumes, partly for the wisdom contained therein, partly for their sublimity and divine height of matter, of which poets and historians make often mention, as very profitable to instruct to good manners, to form and address the republic into the fairest shape of government, by reason of the dignity of men therein mentioned, the dignity of matters therein treated, as Hecateus Aberita plainly testifieth. These things seriously considered, great king, it would do well, may it please you to write to Jerusalem, and to the high priest there, that he would send you six men of every tribe or line, and that they be such as are of good parts and quality, of venerable age, best acquainted and versed in their own law, that being all able translators, they may with judgment choicely select and cull that course of expression which may be of a peace and harmoniously agreeing amongst themselves. And this done, great sir, shall hope you may accomplish a course worthy of so excellent a design, and at last suiting well with, with your desire. The king, having read this request, ordered letters should be drawn and sent to Eleazar the high priest about this matter, in which was signified to him the deliverance of the Jews from their captivity. With the letter, he ordained also to be made ready cups, vessels, and a table of pure gold, with fifty talents of gold, and seventy per cent of silver, for oblations there to be offered with many precious jewels and stones of very great value, commanding the goldsmiths to finish these things with all speed, and the money and talents for the oblations to be raised forthwith. And because you shall at large understand the king alacrity in this affair, I send you here the copy of the letter the king writ, whereof the tenor is as followeth. King Ptolemus Philadelphus to Eliza, high priest of the Jews, considering the great multitude of Jews inhabiting within our territories, of whom some have been led from Jerusalem in the times when the Persians had the power, and others followed our deceased most honorable lord and father, being joined with him, whereof many were received into his pay and ranked as his soldiers and military men the most faithful and trusty of which were established in the strongest forts for garrisons, by that means to curb the insolences of the Egyptians. We since being come to the crown, and having singular inclinations to exercise liberality and munificence towards all persons, and particularly to the citizens, have enfranchised and set at liberty more than a hundred thousand, ordaining that out of our money a just ransom should be paid to all those that held them prisoners, valuing every head at a certain rate as desiring to govern with reason, and to restore them to peace and tranquillity, whom the impetuosity, cruelty, and disorder of war hath disturbed and diverted from right and equity, in which we think to have done a good and pious act, and a work grateful to the great God for all the great favors received of his hands, making him this offering, for having signalized above all the world this our kingdom with a most flourishing peace, tranquillity, and eminent renown and such others as have been slaves and bondmen in our army. We have appointed soldiers in our militia, and those that have been found more worthy for their faith and fidelity, we have made commanders, and preferred them to our court. Further, because it is our desire they and all others of their nation, spread and scattered throughout the universe, may be thankful for our favors. We have resolved to cause your law written in Hebrew letters, to be translated into the Greek language and that our royal library be adorned therewith. As it is with other books, you will do well then as a thing very agreeable to us, and answering our design and intention, if you elect out of every tribe or line of your nation, six of the most aged persons, and such as shall be found of the best breeding and sufficiency, and of greatest authority in the service of the law, 
and that have the best style in writing to make this translation, for so will the truth thereof be better and more easily gathered, if the set of interpreters be men of mature judgment, and well exercised in the law, well weighing that to effect well and worthily such an interpretation and translation, it is needful there should be pains, curious study and reflection, which may be found in the endeavors of many who are more sharp, more subtile, and more discerning than one alone. Moreover, we judge that by the accomplishing so great a work, there will redound to us great honor and glory. For this cause, therefore, we have sent unto you, Andrea, captain of the guard, and Aristeus, men of honorable place in our court, who have commission on our part to present you with jewels for your sacrifices, and an hundred talents of silver for other uses. Herein you will give us great content and pleasure, and express a courtesy resenting amity, if you have need of anything, to require it, for we will not fail to furnish and accommodate you therewith immediately. To which epistle Eleazar answered as follows, Eleazar, the high priest, to King Ptolemius Philadelphus, our most illustrious friend, if you are well, sir, and the Queen Arsino, and my lady your sister, and my lords, your children, God be praised, for health is a thing to be desired, and acknowledged as due unto him, who is giver thereof. As for us, we are in good prosperity, praised be the giver. We have received your letters, which brought us great content, by reason of your counsel, enterprise, and design, as also for the love and good will you bear us. Having received them, we made a great assembly of the people, to whom in a long discourse we have made known your liberality towards our nation, and exposed to view your presence and oblations. To the end they should understand your holy affection and piety towards our God, showing publicly the twenty vessels and vials of gold, the thirty of silver, which you have sent, the five cups of gold, with the table of proportion, and the hundred talents of silver, to be employed for the victims and other uses requisite to the priests, which jewels were to us presented by Andrea, one of your princes, and Aristeus, persons truly worthy of note, both for external beauty and excellency of behavior and condition, as also rare knowledge, briefly, lords worthy in all things of your conversation and justice, by whom we have been fully informed of your will and intention, agreeing with the tenor of your letters. Wherefore we will wholly set ourselves to endeavor to accomplish your desire, for although it be a difficult thing to bring well to perfect effect, yet for the times to come it will be an argument of our great confederation and amity, for you have obliged our citizens with a great, and as it were, an inestimable beneficence, whereupon we have offered to God the sacrifice of thanksgiving for you, your sister children, and friends, and the whole multitude of people hath prayed to God for your prosperity, and that it will please him to address your affection in all your acts and that God the ruler of all things will make your realm to flourish, and increase in peace and glory, and that the translation of the sacred law may redound unto your profit and advantage. After these sacrifices were accomplished, all the people being together, we chose persons of better rank, and men of honor, and of good life and report, being six of every tribe or line, which we have sent to you, with the holy law, which was left us by the inspired writer Moses. Be it your pleasure, sir, to return them us, after the translation of the books shall be completed. These are the names of those that were chosen from all the lines and tribes of the Jews to go to Egypt, to make the first translation of the Holy Bible, or law of Moses, of the first tribe. Josephus, Ezekias, Zacharias, Joannes, Ezekias, Helicius, of the second. Judas, Simon, Somoelus, Adaeus, Matthias, Eschemius, of the third, Nehemius, Josephus, Theodosius, Basias, Ornius, Dasus, of the fourth, Jonathus, Oxius, Helicius, Ananius, Chebrius, Satius, of the fifth, Jassicus, Jacobus, Jesus, Cabotus, Simon, Lewis, of the sixth, Judas, Josephus, Simon, Zacharias, Sumlus, Selemias, of the seventh, Sabatins, Jason, Jesus, Theodotus, Joannes, Jonathus, the eighth, Theodosius, Jason, Jesus, Theodotus, Joannes, Jonathus, the ninth, Theophilus, Abrahamus, 
Asamus, Jason, Endemius, Danielus, the tenth, Hiremius, Eliezerus, Zacharias, Baneus, Helesius, Dethius, the eleventh, Samuel, Josephus, Judas, Jothas, Chabel, Decetheus, the twelfth, Isilus, Joannes, Theodosius, Asamanus, Abiethas, Azesilus, number of all seventy-two. Such was the answer to the letters of the king. Now I will declare to you the most succinctly I can possible, the beauty and workmanship of the things we found in Jerusalem, being with Eleazar, and those also which were sent to him, for all was wrought with singular art, and of most exquisite beauty, the king being therein so careful and intent to perform abundantly all that was necessary for finishing so extraordinary work, that of his own proper motion he went and came, visiting every one of the master workmen and goldsmiths, whom he kept so close to their business, that he permitted them no idle time for sport or debauches. Of the presents sent unto Eleazar, chief priest of the Jews, by King Ptolemius Philadelphus, and first of the table of gold. It behoveth, then, that first we describe the table, for it was a work of admirable luster, the king desiring to show therein a masterpiece of work. Wherefore he demanded the measure and dimension of the table which was in the temple of Jerusalem, and the ornaments of the same. When he knew the measure, he asked if they would receive a greater, and being answered by some of the priests and others, if there were no let, a greater might have placed there. The king then replied that he intended to give one five times bigger than that was there, provided that might not be inconvenient for the priests by its disproportionable quantity. Further, consideration ought not only to be had of the receipt and capacity of the place, but also of its accommodation to the sacrifices thereon to be prepared, and that he was not without consideration, that the Jews had not made that which they then had in their temple of so small size for penury and want of gold, for when it was made, they abounded in all wealth and riches, but that it seemed to him they had so proportioned it from some reason of a perfect dimension. Therefore his opinion was, that the present would not be well and duly formed, if the table he intended to make were longer or higher than the other, therefore forecasting in his thoughts, which were clear and ready to weigh everything with good judgment. He gave it in charge to the goldsmiths that were most ingenious, and of best capacity, to finish and accomplish the business. Engraven and adorned with all possible variety, commanding that those who wrought in the borders, raisings, flowers, wrappings, intortulations, and such like, should amuse themselves only for beautifying and decoration, and what was to be plain should answer to the measure and dimension, and that in all these things they should be exquisitely careful. This table was two cubits large, and a cubit and a half in height, nor are you to think it was covered with plates of gold superficially, for it was made all of solid, massy, pure, and fine gold. Round about it was a crown of twelve fingers large, wrapped with bars of gold and other pretty works in fair passages, in manner of little threads, and interlaced with little cords retiring to the canatils, a work very shining, and polished of the three sides, for the table was made in a triangular form, and on every side wrought of the same fashion, so that on what sides soever one stood, it appeared to be but one frontispiece and one face, for if you came to behold it on one side, the plane of the table by the crown with which it was bordered, discovered to your eyes a most resplendent beauty very admirable, and the outward work with the rays and splendor of the two squares so dazzled the eyes that one could scarce behold it, for the table, as we have said, was triangular, and showed with one and the same front and superficies on which side soever you turned. It was also enchased with precious stones fastened by golden buttons tied with loops, and these stones were wrought so naturally within one another that they showed a string and wreathing of such subtlety, that to any one's thinking it was not possible to be imitated. And those stones were supported and stayed by buckles and clasps of gold for more firmness, and the joints and connextures of squares made with so great art, knit and interwoven one within another, to keep sure and join all the work, that in beholding them the art was scarce discernible. Moreover, in the great compass of the crown that environed the table by the aspect above, there was a row of stones in fashion of little ovals that were riveted, and locked together, 
and filed with little wreaths of gold which raised the luster. And these oval stones were thick set the one with the other, and the whole table was as it were encircled with this thread of ovals. A little above this chain of wreathed stones the master goldsmiths had labored a girdle of flowers and clusters of all fruits, interlaced and following together so well, that by their eminent risings amongst the bosses of the encircling crown you might see grapes clustered together, ears of corn, dates, apples, olives, roses, and many such like, amongst which many precious stones set and wrought in gold in their color and form, in their true and natural resemblance, representing those fruits with admirable art. And with this adornment the cornishes and frontispiece of the table were enriched all round, and so was this work of fruits corresponding with the oval stones above said. To all these decorations are joined other burnished works, cut in sculpture and in part with wreaths and verges of gold, beautifying all the circuit of the table, so that from the two parts which presented themselves to the sight, with the beauty of the crown to the place where stood the feet of the table, one might see a like beauty and curiosity of folding, still full of luster which parts soever of the table were turned. They made the plate of all the tables solid and massy, of the thickness of four fingers, to the end that they might more firmly and fixedly bind in the feet and trestles to support it strongly. These feet were fastened to the crown without being perceived how, and were firmly joined with buckles and clasps, in such manner that the table might be supported and well fixed which way soever the table were turned, and yet still shining to the eye. In the superficies hereof was represented in a fair work the flowed of meander, running with its circuits, returns, and windings, in the channel of which one might see a splendor of precious stones, representing its rowling waves, which wreath was of carbuncles, emeralds, agates, and all other sorts of precious stones, sparkling with their native luster. Near to this flower there was an interlaced work as a wreath of hair, a thing admirable to behold, showing in its aspect a geometric figure, made of crystal and amber, and this figure was a solid square, whereof all the squares were equal, and the angles of the four sides oblique. In this polished figure was showed the forms of the beholders, as in a fair mirror. For the rest, the ingenious hand of the master workman had made the feet of the table like flower de luces, of which the flowers turning shell-like backwards, sustained the table, the said flower de luces thick with leaves, sprouting up as from within. The foot was sustained and stayed in this manner. There was a stone of a carbuncle, of which the length was twelve fingers, having the form of a rock made in a precipice, and had about eight fingers in breadth, and upon this stone was borne up all the burthen and weight of the trestle. Upon this rises up a lyre or herb-string, which twining about the enclosure of a vine, embraced it even to the top, the grapes hanging about on every side. In this table were four feet alike in disposition and proportion of workmanship. And of all four was one selfsame perspective, and so well were these things accomplished and perfected, with admirable skill and contrivance, of men inventive and ingenious that not only the aspect of things true was made as it were false and illusory to the eyes, but also one might hear the leaves rattle by stirring of a little wind moving them one against another. So were all things labored even as it were to the life and nature, everything shaping a lively image of what it was designed to represent. Moreover, the tresses of the table were contrived, movable, and to be removed on all sides, wherein there was a secret of workmanship which could not be seen nor perceived for the greatness of the work, and by the means of certain clasps all was to be removed together, although no one could perceive either crevice, joint, or rivet. For the table was no more than a cubit and a half big in all, yet thereupon was great expense bestowed, and many talents employed. For after the king had resolved not to exceed the measure and size of that which was in Jerusalem, all that he determined to lay out upon one much greater was employed, and much more. In the decoration of this, thus all was done with great skill and design, and was very admirable and extraordinary according to the king's wish, of the vessels, cups, and vials of gold. The two cups from the foot to the middle were cut all in a scaly work, and betwixt every two scales, riveted with precious stones, the radiant shine whereof, 
cast such a reflection to the eyes that it wounded the sight with a glory. The tower of these cups was girt with a sculpture of the flood of meander, of the height of a cubit, all encompassed and interlaced with variety of stones, of inestimable beauty and value. Near the flood there was a tress of hairs of gold, with tufts joined together from the bowl above to the bottom, being spread in clear ways like a net of thread, in the middle parts whereof were to be seen many precious stones, disposed in the form and figure of a scutcheon, amongst which there was only a space or interval of four fingers, whose splendor made the grace of the work more agreeable to the eye. Upon the lips and border of the cups there was a crown interlaced with flower de luces, bunches of grapes, intermixed one with another, and wreathed like cordage, and so running round. These cups, thus wrought with most rich workmanship, held more than two metrets, but the tankards of silver were yet adorned and decorated with much more beauty, in full work and polish, for within they were so resplendent that one might see all things more to the life than in a mirror, and it is not possible to tell how the figures of all things were represented to the life by the polish and sparkling brightness of them, which were so radiant and shining that if you set one of the silver cups by one of the gold, then one of the silver, and so one of gold, and so followed this method. They made an admirable show, and impossible to be long looked on, for they cast such a lightning from one side to another, with rays penetrating one another's luster, that it even dazzled and reverberated the point of the sight, so that no soul was long able to behold them, for if you turned your eyes to a cup of gold, they were so encountered with the order and splendor of the work's variety, and with the force of the light and flaming, which would so strike the point of the sight, that you could hardly hold them from twinkling, so as you would be forced to turn them elsewhere, or not too steadily to behold their lightning. And if you looked upon one of silver, a greater effusion of light was shed abroad, so that your eyes seized with dimness, you were not able to discern thoroughly the, the structure and art, for the vessels and vials of gold, they were wrought with such design, that the middles were adorned with clusters of grapes, the verges and lips with bunches and encirclings of leaves of myrrh and olives, wreathed together in fashion of a crown, about all the mouth parts, and all set with precious stones, agreeing with the spaces and convenience of the distances, so as, I assure you, the master workman had expressed their art in embellishing and adorning everything with an ambitious desire to grace the design, and to exalt the magnificence of the king, so that in all the treasures, nor in all the cabinets, nor what other things soever, was not to be found anything so rich, so fair, or so precious, as were these royal works. For the king, who had a tender regard of his honor, there had employed all care and diligence, and prodigally lavished his magnificence, for of his own accord he came often to visit the works, conversing and mingling his advice with the master goldsmiths, making them change, now this, now that, according to his liking. Likewise he forbade them expressly to stir from their business, till all were finished and completed according to his mind, so that all was perfected with great art in a most extraordinary manner, as well for a testimony of his illustrious excellence and degree, as also for the dignity of the high priest, who was of so honorable a character, for whom these things were intended. Of great value was the multitude of stones, of which some were so rare as that they are scarce known, yet being of marvelous greatness, they amounted to the number of five thousand, and yet for all that the art was of greater value than the stones, and all being valued together. It plainly appeared that both precious stones and curious workmanship exceeded five times the gold therein employed, both in beauty and value. In fine, I hope what I have already written may yield you some delight in knowing these rare and curious things, and the true love and ingenious goodness of the king therein. Now that which follows will set forth the discourse of our journey to Eleazar. And because you may at large understand all circumstances, I will describe to you first the province, or city of Jerusalem, and then the country round it. Of the city of Jerusalem, and the country round it. When we arrived near to Jerusalem, we discovered the town, situate on the mountain, in the midst of the province of Judea, opening thereby a far extended prospect to the view. On the top of the hill is situate the temple, of a most graceful figure, and aspect, and very fair to the eye. 
about the same is a girdle of three tire of walls raised to the height of seventy cubits, and of convenient thickness in proportion to the height, which encompass all the temple with an excellent beauty and magnificent work. The sight of the gates, the knitting and evenness of the stones, the frontispieces and buttresses, the faces of the portals represent a beauty with great luster and excellency of workmanship, and one might plainly see that in all this structure there was a rich abundance of all things, and that no expense had been wanting. Without the, the temple, there was a veil by which the temple was closed. Round this veil was hanged travers from the magnificence of the portals, yielding a very pleasing spectacle, and principally then, when a little wind rose from the pavement, and entering within the veil, ran from low to high, making undulations and billows like waves, and moving delightfully with gales following one another, reciprocally in successive blowing. Within the temple there was an altar accompanied with a chimney very properly and conveniently built, accommodate to the place for the victims there to be offered. The stairs to ascend thither were fair and evenly disposed, agreeable to the magnificence of the place, both for comeliness as for the ease of the priests, who were invested with garments of linen very delicate and soft. The forepart of the temple looking to the east turns the back of it to the west, and the spaces thereof are adjusted with exact proportion, in all dimension and show a beauty very excellent, and work of good grace. The floor is paved with stones, the receptacles of the waters which issue in great quantity for the use of washing the victims after they have slain them, are hid in convenient places, for in their festival days many thousands of victims are offered by means whereof is furnished out so great a quantity of water, that one would judge there issued commonly a considerable spring. But this is a thing yet more admirable, and almost incredible, the greatness of the conveyances of these waters which are underground in the temple, and stretch five furlongs in circuit. And to conduct these waters into their receptacles, there are pipes of lead closed within the walls, drawing in all parts under the pavement of the temple by which the waters void themselves after the beasts are washed. Likewise many spouts and openings near to the foot of the altar, which are unknown to all, but only those who serve the sacrifices, and by these too the blood of the offerings in like manner is cleansed and carried off. We guess the great quantity of waters there shed by this means. The Jews having led us to walk out of the town more than a league long, they showed us a place, where we might hear the report of the waters that ran under the earth, which seemed to me to be such as when one voids water by whole tons, of the priests. But all that is past was as nothing in respect of the worth, honesty, and silence of the priests and their services. For without any difficulty they composed themselves to their business, every one according to his degree and charge, without staying for orders, some kindling the wood, others the oil, some bring the wheat flour, others the aromatic odors, others the flesh, every one showing his obedience with an admirable dexterity. For taking the calves by the thighs, though they weighed more than two talents, they lifted them on high, with an admirable speed, and not more handsomely than easily, in such a sort, as they never failed to fix them at first in as good order as they were to continue. They did the same with the fardels of sheep and goats, for all offerings, and victims were to be without spot and fat. Moreover, there was a place prepared for their repose, where they all lay, and rose most willingly and diligently, without being called or waked, and so applied themselves to their business in their order, one after another, but all with so great silence, that although they were ordinarily about seven hundred Levites, without reckoning a great troop of those that offered the victims, yet it seemed as if they all had been but one man, all things were composed with so great gravity and reverence to God, of the high priest Eleazar. What we had of greatest admiration, amongst other things, was when we saw Eleazar present himself to the sacrifices in his glory and majesty, clothed in his habit and robes, in pontificalibus, shining all with the luster of precious stones, for to his accoutrements hung round little bells of gold, yielding a sweet harmony, amongst which he had also pomegranates of marvellous colours, and all distinguished with variety of flowers. Upon this vestment he wore a girdle, which girt him very comely, and the work was of very fair colours. Beneath his breast hung what they call the rational, wherein there was twelve precious stones of divers colours set in gold, 
in which were inscribed the names of the princes of each tribe which had been the beginning, and all was most resplendent and natural, almost beyond belief. His head was adorned with a royal bonnet, upon which was set a meter of incomparable beauty, exalting the coif to a majestic state. Beneath the mitre hung a plate of gold upon the forehead of Eleazar, covering his eyebrows, wherein was inscribed the name of God in the sacred letters, a spectacle in truth full of great glory, and worthy of such mystery, for with this dress the shine and reflection was of such show and worthy dignity, that it might beget an awful sense and apprehension in those that beheld him. So as this high priest represented to the beholder as it were the figure of a god, in short, everything being by us contemplated, held our spirits in a suspense and amazement through their beauty. For the manner and decoration now of one thing, and then another drew our understandings, even by force, maturely to consider them, of the fortress or castle of Jerusalem. Thence we ascended to visit the fortress. It is situated near to the temple in a most fair seat, fortified with many towers framed of stones of extreme greatness. And by what we could understand and know it is the bulwark and strength of the temple, to the end that if there happened any sedition or impetuous hostile invasion, nobody should enter by force within the cloister of the temple which is near, and is defended by the high walls of this fortress, situated in a place of precipitate steepness, having its sentinels and ramparts with engines of war. This place is kept and guarded by a garrison of lusty young soldiers vigorous and strong, which are maintained by all the towers within, and are such as for their merits to their country, are esteemed of great reputation. They have no liberty to go out of the fortress, except upon holy days, and then with great solemnity only part of them, and to relieve the guards and they dare let no person in, for the captain of the place there useth such watchful diligence when he goes forth, and amongst them makes such watch and diligent search, that he cannot be circumvented by any spy, as it happened to us, for but two of us could get admittance, and that without arms and by great entreaties, and only to see the sacrifices, for he told us, and that with an oath, that all those who are of this garrison, which are in number five hundred, have sworn to admit but at most five persons at a time, because the conservation and safety of the temple consists in the keeping of this fort, which if it should be taken and kept, the temple had no other security of the town. The greatness of the town, by what we could judge, extends in compass some forty furlongs, a city certainly worthy to be regarded, both for the beauty of the walls and distribution of the towers. It is distinguished into fair and straight streets, and those well paved, where there are many little lanes and channels in fit and convenient places, so that though the city be seated on a hill, all come up to it, and go down from it with great ease. At the entries of the streets there are cut-out steps in form of scaffolds, which one mounts by stairs like open galleries, where the most eminent persons walk higher than others, that have means to walk by places which are lower, and these banked ways, as it were, are in the most principal streets, to the end that those who bear the holy things should not be polluted with filth and dirt, by which one may judge their ancestors have wisely and with good reason chosen such a place for the seat of the town, making so fit a choice in all things whatsoever. Of the country round Jerusalem, and of the policy of the peasants or country people, this country is spacious and fair, stretching from one side towards Samaria, and the neighboring Idumea, which is a plain country, on the other side, the coasts are fair and fertile. And it is no marvel if this region be so abounding and fertile of itself, and plentiful in all good fruits, being also that it is manured by the industry and great care of the country people. And it is not here, as it is commonly seen about good and fertile lands, where the peasants are idle, careless, and for the abounding pleasures and voluptuousness of cities, despise their labors and according as we see youth is taken with delights and idleness, become effeminate and tender. Which truly happened to Alexandria, a city rich, wealthy, and abounding in all good things, where the youth of the country that used to follow country works, diverting and amusing their rough condition with the pleasures and ease of a delicious life, forget their country business and labor, and became idle and slothful. And for such reasons, doubtless, 
their Jewish kings ordained that these peasants should make no stay in the city, and that no one of them should dwell anywhere but in his country farm longer than twenty days, and that, unless for urgent and important reasons, because they should not lose their time, for which reasons it was ordained that all processes and controversies of lawsuits should be determined in five days, and never depend longer, and for this was published a law, and the reason thereof delegated to the judges and ministers of every country, that the peasants should not sojourn or make abode in the towns, as is said, because of the demurs of their suits, neglecting their country business, which might cause damage and loss to the revenues of their prince, diminishing his tributes and dues, arising from these laborers. I am the larger upon this, because we had advice hereof in discoursing with Eleazar. The peasants, therefore, are very careful and diligent in their labors and menagerie, by reason whereof in such a multitude of people, the region is planted all with fruit trees, abounding everywhere in corn and all sorts of grain, the vineyards clothed with vines, nor is it possible to tell the number of palm trees, olive trees, fig trees, besides pastures for the raising of cattle, which they breed up in great numbers, so as they have not only all place, as it were, of choice for this purpose, but also a provident care still to dispose it for the reception and entertainment of so great a number of people, nor have they appointed this course for the villages, but that thereby they might fully furnish and beautify their towns. Besides, there comes abundance of aromatic drugs, of gold, and precious stones to them from Arabia. For this province opens, as it were, a fair or general market, to all round about for traffic and commerce. The city is full of tradesmen, having no want of anything that may be brought by sea, for it is accommodated by the neighborhood of the ports of Ascalon, of Japhet, of Gaza, and of Acre, cities founded by their kings for this purpose of accommodation, and those cities we have named are a great convenience to this town, as not being too near nor too remote, so as it is very easy to have all things necessary in a short time, with assurance of the ways to the comers and the country is washed throughout by the river Jordan, whose water never fails. This river, having its source from the east, runs no less than sixty thousand paces. In the best and most fertile countries on the banks of this river, heretofore inhabited, and conquered those valiant troops of Jews, who in their times conquered the country, and passed this river, being in number more than six hundred thousand. This Jordan swells and increaseth in the summer, and overflows the neighboring fields like the Nile, covering a great part of the ground, and then falls into another river by Acre, both which empty at once into the sea. There are many other streams that bend their course towards Gaza and Azota, that have their turnings and windings through all the whole province. The force, strength, and assurance of this region consists in places inaccessible and difficult to come at, and so unnaturally strong for all the country is environed with mountains, rocks, and precipices cut straight down as it were with a plummet. In other parts it is enclosed with rivers and currents, so as the valleys and the plains are fortified with great ditches and trenches. On the other side, the ways are so narrow and troublesome, with turnings and windings, to and fro, that with great difficulty those that travel by land come to the great city. They say also they were wont in former times to draw up metals from the mountains of the bordering Arabia. But since the time that the Persians had rule, this search of metals was left off, the expense being more than the advantage, and the labor fruitless. Yet they say this excuse was invented by the inhabitants of those places, to the end that their lands should not be swallowed up in the hollowness of the mines, so that the earth being open, no passage could be afforded to strangers in those narrow ways. And so much for these things, brother Philocrates, I have discovered unto thee. Now I will declare what concerns the law, and its interpretation, and first translation, what the translators of the holy law were. Those that were chosen were very honest and virtuous men, excelling in all knowledge, descended of noble race, and not only well versed in their own Judaic learning, but also well acquainted and exercised in the Greek letters, for they were reserved men and always ready to be employed as ambassadors upon occasion, for which they were, as it were, purposely bred, and as proper, and able to judge of those things and courses as the case required. 
and were those that expounded the public rules, and resolved with great sufficiency all difficulties in their own law, and had marvellous readiness, both for haranguing and giving sentence. They were men clearly void of all barbarous incivility, of good and sweet condition, and born as it were to follow their proper manner of living and estate in a mediocrity and most commendable modesty still striving above all things to exceed all others in wisdom and good knowledges, and in these endeavours consisted all their study, esteeming no search more than how to excel one the other in accessible graciousness and sweetness of hearing and answering, so that every one of them were esteemed of in their tribe, as men worthy to have preeminence and principality for the virtue that was in them, and it is worth the noting in what honour they held Eleazar, and in what respect he held them for besides that he writ to the king to take care for their convenient return, he recommended with a passionate desire and tender affection these reverend persons to Andrea, desiring with many entreaties and requests that we should, with our credits and grace with the king, open them a fair access, to which we made answer that as these things were matters of our special charge, so we should be careful to discharge ourselves answerably with all due care, wherefore we desired he would be at ease in that point for they should therein be absolutely free. I assure you, said he, I am upon this occasion in no little pain, and not without just cause, for I know the king, a prince so diligent, a lover of virtuous and worthy persons, and how industriously he seeks them, that there is no place free from his desires, when he hears where such are, that excel, or are remarkable for wit or learning. And I have been informed, that he useeth to say what is most true, that in such manner of men dwells and consists the strength and defence of his kingdom, and especially when he hath near about his person good store of wise and just men, who have provident counsel to give him, lest all should miscarry, which I perceive well by those he hath pleased to send hither, and we earnestly profess that we send not these persons to be assisting to him in the affairs of his government, but for the public profit and an universal good of all his people in which regard nothing ought to be refused, nothing that we will not endure. For though the form of well-living consists in the observation and accomplishment of moral precepts and constitutions, nevertheless it is better learned and taught by the knowledge and experience of the things themselves, than in the abstracted nakedness of words. By this speech and such like, we came to know what great affection Eleazar did bear to these persons, of the answers made by Eleazar, upon certain points of the law of Moses. It behoveth also, we touch briefly the answers Eleazar made us to our questions. For knowing the Jews with great nicety esteem the observances and differences of meats and drinks, according to their law and that of certain beasts, they esteem some unclean and infected. We therefore inquired, saying, Since all things are of one and the same creation, and receive one and the same substance, Whence is it that some are rejected as infectious, as well to eat as to touch, so that, as it should seem, the law createth more magisterially than rationally? Eleazar then answered, You know not, said he, what force and virtue custom hath as to well living, and what alterations and changes she brings in humane affairs. See we not that those who converse with the evil let themselves loose to a course of corruption in manners? whereby they become wretched all their lives after. On the contrary, those that accustom and habituate themselves with the wise and intelligent, although they are yet ignorant, change from good to better, and become happy and fortunate, which our lawmaker considering, resolving all his laws into piety and justice, he hath not only taught us all we ought to do by words, but expressed all by instances, and forbidding us to do evil hath set before our eyes the causes why God hath created everything. First, he hath taught that God is one and all, by the power of whom all things are governed and subsist, and that he is present in all places, and without whom nothing can remain in its being, be it never so little, and that nothing can be hidden from him, whatsoever men do upon earth never so secretly, even what men do and think within themselves or what they plod and contract one with another. All is to him notorious and naked before his eyes, for he sees the things to come, as if they were present. Moreover, 
He out of his gracious goodness teacheth us that when any one sets himself to work evil, he may assure himself it cannot be hidden, and proposes thus by all the law, no other thing than to show the power and strength of our good God. Being then heedful of the beginning of these things, he showeth that other people who have opinion that there are many gods are themselves more powerful than the gods they by folly adore. For they affirm foolishly that the images and resemblances they frame of stone or of wood are the representations and shapes of those who have brought to light by their inventions some advantages to the civil affairs of life, and these they worship, prostrating themselves on their knees before them. But they are out of their right wits, and indeed out of themselves, and if one demand of them what are their inventions, they allege something produced from nature, as if it were indeed a thing produced, created, and composed by the foresaid inventors, although they never contributed thereto, in which they sufficiently manifest their perverseness and stupidity. For it is well known that if there be question of any good invention, that there may be found at this day persons more learned, more subtle, and more quick to invent any art than they have done, who have been in times past, yet they are not therefore adored as gods although the sage Greeks esteem such inventors worthy of honor. What shall I speak of the Egyptians and their neighbors, who are herein madder than the others? For these have some of them brought in divine worship to brute beasts, others unto reptiles, out of common reason, and all understanding, making sacrifices to the living and dead, immolating to them victims. Wherefore the wise and understanding lawmaker, being instituted of God in the knowledge of all things, hath hedged us in, and fortified us round as it were with a trench and palisado, and distinguished us with a wall of iron, to the end that being innocent in soul and pure in body, we might not mingle ourselves in any sort with other nations, and that rejecting all fond and vain opinions, we might adore one only God, who hath power above all creatures. For this the priests of the Egyptians, princes of the people, although they fail in other things, name, us men of God, and agree with us in many things, because other people have not this religion to adore one only God, according to the truth as we do. For others give themselves over to gormandizings and drunkenness, building upon shadows, amusing themselves with no other things but pleasures and belly cheer, of which there is no one of us hath so much as thought, but all the course of our lives is employed only to the knowledge of virtue and divine power. To the end we fall not into sin, nor be polluted by the conversation of such people in any manner whatever. He hath also defended and armed us on all sides with purity and honesty, not only in our meat and drink, but also in what we handle, touch, see, and hear, for he hath reduced and brought all things before our natural reason, for as all things have their being from one power, so with a most profound judgment hath he appointed which we are to use and from which we are to abstain. I will allege you one or two, for example, to the end, that if you take heed to the words and plain speech, you cannot think that Moses hath taken such pains to ordain his laws, because of rats, weasels, and such like things. For it is necessary you understand, that he hath very well and wisely ordered all things to the honesty of living, having regard to purity and cleanliness, and to the correction and amendment of manners. And as for birds, and flying fowls, he hath permitted us to eat ordinarily of such as are tame, and are different from others in neatness and cleanliness, and that live upon grain and seeds, such as are pigeons, turtles, peacocks, partridge, geese, and the like. And such as he hath forbidden us to eat, they are wild, ravenous, living upon flesh and carrion, of proud natures, inclined to rapine and prey and such as by force set upon others, and seek not their living, but to the damage, hurt, and injury of the other poultry who are gentle and tame, but those fierce ones not only seize upon those of their own kind, but also upon lambs, kids, and even upon men yet living, or half dead. Our lawmaker, therefore, noting this by way of similitude, and by a borrowed way of translation, taken from the nature of such fowls, hath pronounced them unclean and infectious, as being willing to reduce and bring all things to the consideration of purity and cleanliness of the soul, to the end that every one being admonished by ordinary and domestic examples, may understand how it behoveth to use equity and justice, 
and that it is not granted to man, be he never so strong, powerful, proud, bold, and audacious soever, to ravish by force that of another, nor to do injury to any person, but that it is convenient, he should order the course of his life in imitation of the fowl I have spoken of, who live by grain, leading a tame and tractable life, and that it is not lawful to vex and trouble any person of our own kind, nor ravage his goods by force, as do those beasts he hath prohibited us to eat, and not to use violence in any case which is figured by the nature of beasts. Not wholly void of sense, you understand then the reason why he hath forbidden us the use of the said things, that is to say, because of the inclination and nature of every beast. You may therefore now well conceive how our lawgiver Moses hath been careful in all things to correct our manners, and establish them by the things to which we are accustomed, and therefore to regard the nature of brute beasts. For where he hath licensed us eating the flesh of four-footed beasts, who have two, and the hoofs cloven, the import is that we ought to direct our operations to justice and bounty, by this cloven hoof figuring to us the distribution of rewards and punishments, for which cause we are cleft and divided from other nations, to the end we be not polluted with sin by their conversation and company, for many people of the Gentiles are sullied with impiety by mixture of one with another, and not only suffer the provinces and cities to be spotted, infected, and dishonored with sins against nature, but are foully stained with the unclean blood of childbearing women, having no shame or regret to commit incest with their own daughters, from which things we are wholly alienated. Moreover, where he hath noted to us the sign of this forking, he hath also advised us to be recollected by the same figure, in the same animals, for he hath added further, that they should be such as chew the cud, by which he manifestly admonisheth us to have this rumination in memory, and in the course of our life. For what signifieth the chewing of the cud, but that we ought still to have in our minds a continual revolving of our lives and actions, and so by a frequent meditation, the duties to which we are obliged, and what we owe to all. Even as the life of the body is ever in our thoughts, so as our spirit is nourished in bringing to mind her employments, and for this cause, he saith in the Scripture, Have God still in thy memory and thought, who hath done for thee such great and wonderful things, if this thou truly considerest? Thou shalt find it great and admirable indeed. For first, thou shalt behold the architecture of the body, the distribution and transfusion of the elements, the connection and ligatures of the members, a thing truly worthy of admiration. But it will be more admirable if thou hast regard to the sense which is given to every member. If thou weighest the actions of the understanding, if thou considerest the invisible movements, and how in each of them there shines a vigour and vivacity of spirit, from whence have proceeded the inventions of arts almost innumerable. Wherefore, not without cause, Moses commanded us to have in constant consideration that all things have been established and made examples by the divine power and providence, for so hath he finished and counterpoised every thing agreeing with its time and place, recalling always to mind the consideration of God the Lord, ruler and creator of the whole universe. And if we will begin with what concerns eating and drinking, hath he not well and prudently commanded, that we should give praises and thanks to God when we sit at table, in which he hath not permitted us to devise or discourse of anything in the world that should make us forget or efface in our memories the power and providence of God. Wherefore he hath appointed that we engrave upon the doors and portals of our houses such inscriptions as should excite us to thanksgiving, still to refresh our memories with the thoughts of God and his goodness to us, by a most evident sign that all our endeavors ought always to be to mind us of sincerity and equity, and that each thought ought always to represent God before our eyes. Also he hath appointed that not only when we sit at table, but when we rise, we should praise the works of God not only in word, but also with a grave and composed countenance, reducing to mind the perpetual motion of the heavens, and that this alternative and successive nature is divine and incomprehensible to man. Thus to you is expounded the reason of the forking of the cloven foot, its import, as also of the chewing of the cud which you inquired after, assuring you that there is nothing ordained which is superfluous or improper for the forming of the mind, but by this figurative manner and use, 
he hath accommodated all things according to truth. Also the said lawgiver, by a like figure, hath admonished us from falling into injustice and sin, by the hearing, or too much relying upon our eloquence, prattle, and jesting, which we may learn in the consideration of vile beasts. For the weasels are of a filthy complexion, as also rats, and such like creatures, which he hath forbidden us to handle or touch. For rats, they make all things foul, infectious, and hurtful, and are not only pernicious to eat, but wholly unprofitable to man in all things. And weasels are a sort of vermin which are yet fouler, more infectious, and the most filthy and impure of all those we speak of. For they conceive by the ear, and bring forth their young by the throat, which is a thing detestable in men, in what they hear and report, receiving by the ear any cursed folly, to utter and be delivered of the same by the tongue and report, and to exasperate the same by words odious and bitter, of which oft times there arises cause of great inconvenience, and that which of itself is nauseous and loathsome, they improve and amplify with an elaborate wicked invention by all means possible. Wherefore your king, as we have heard, justly causes such men to be punished capitally. I think, said I then, that by such you mean the emphonists, for the king punisheth those without hope or mercy, by process, with tortures and sufferings, and even with an ignominious death. They are the same, said Eleazar, for their idleness and negligence brings nothing to men but mischief, and most dangerous ruin and destruction. And likewise our law commands to do no wrong or injury to any person, either by word or deed. See then how I advertise you in short, and show you that all our demeanors by the law are directed to justice and equity, and that our holy scriptures allow not anything that in appearance is evil, nor ought to be done impertinently and with choler, but we are commanded that in all our lives we demean ourselves towards all men, in all our conversations and deportments, justly and graciously, as having always in mind God for the great judge of secrets. Now to whom could it seem otherwise? but that Eleazar had well and pertinently spoken of those filthy vermin, reptiles, and of other creatures also, manifesting thereby very properly, that all the letter of the law tended to no other end than justice, and to shape and fashion well the manners and dispositions of men. Further, he delivered himself concerning the oblations of calves, of sheep, and of goats, raising thereupon a fair discourse, showing that it was their custom to select such beasts from the folds and herds as were tractable and tame, to make them their offerings to God, never offering sacrifice with wild or hurtful beasts, because those that made these oblations and offered them should not entertain savage thoughts, or be elated with intractable pride, but instructed by the gentle and innocent nature of the victims, and that they should learn from such instances to become humble and patient and in their sacrificing to have their minds erect, as raised to God the Creator of all things. Hitherto, Philocrates, I have framed to you, by writing these memorable things, considering the itch you have to learn and to know, which I have done, to the end, that by this little you may understand the majesty of the law, the causes and natural considerations that are therein contained, and now I will return from whence we have digressed, the return of the ambassadors to Alexandria, with the doctors of the Jews, and how the king adored the holy law seven times, with tears in his eyes. Eleazar then, after the sacrifices were performed, as was customary, having chosen the persons as is before specified, to send unto the king, he sent him also many rich presents, which indeed were very splendid. When therefore we had taken leave, and parted from him very friendly, with his salutation of peace, and were returned to Alexandria, our arrival was forthwith made known to the king. And soon after Andrea and myself entered into the king's hall, and making most humble reverence, we presented to his majesty the letters of Eleazar. Then the king, overjoyed that the event of this voyage had succeeded so well, having obtained the persons much to be wished for, made the crowd of those that attended on their petitions and suits, to quit the place, and commanded, that the Jewish doctors should immediately have notice to attend, which was sooner than they expected. For the custom of the country is, when any ambassadors arrive upon any business they are sent about, it is not permitted them to be presented to the king, unless they are ambassadors from kings, 
or from very honorable states and republics, nor without great difficulty to have audience till thirty days after their arrival, and sometimes longer, as the king is pleased to make a difference, with regard to the degree of those that sent them. But the king, having cleared the place of those he judged not necessary to this entertainment, continued in the hall, expecting till the doctors were presented to make their obeisance, who, being introduced, did their duties in delivering the presents sent the king from Eleazar. Likewise they presented him with divers skins of parchment, exceeding fine, smooth, and delicate, bound up with a binding very rare and uncommon, in which skins was the divine law of Moses in letters of gold, and in the Hebrew language, a thing very curious to behold. Upon their presenting them to the king, sitting in his chair of state, the king presently turned towards them, taking notice of them all one after another, and then required of them the volumes of the law. Then they unfolded the royals wrapped up in these skins of parchment or vellum aforesaid, which the king seriously beholding, remained as one transported a pretty space, after which he adored the holy law seven times, saying these words, We give you thanks, my masters, and much more him that sent you hither, and the high God, above all, of whom these are the sacred words. Then the said doctors, and all those who were attending the king, let fall great expressions of joy with acclamation, and there fell tears of joy from the king's eyes, as we see many times, that exceeding transports will draw tears from the eyes, especially in excesses of a more sublime and intellectual nature. Then the king required the skins and volumes of the law should be folded up again, which done, he saluted the doctors, saying, Reason requires, grave sirs, that first we pay you honor and regard, inasmuch as we were the occasion of your coming hither, for which cause we give you our hand with this assurance, that this very day shall be to us the day, that all the days of our life we will hold great and memorable, and shall be solemnized every year with feasting, in perpetual memory of your visit, as also of our victory which we obtained this day against Antigonus at sea. Wherefore it is our will, that this very day you solace yourselves in feasting with us. Forthwith he required the princes should be invited, amongst whom he did me the honor to make me to be seated. Moreover, he caused to be exposed to view all the rich furniture, wherewith the palace royal was, upon great festivals, used to be decked. Likewise he commanded they should fit up lodgings near to the castle, in the most splendid manner they could, and in like manner the king ordered that the feasts should be set out in the most sumptuous and magnificent fashion that was possible. And then the king enjoined Nicanor, his chief physician, to bid Dorothea controller of the house, as from the will and pleasure of his majesty, that he should, and that with all diligence, deliver out all things necessary for every one of the doctors, as well for their accommodation, as for the furniture of their lodgings, and that without fail, as from the ordinance and command of the king, which was forthwith accomplished with great dispatch by many hands, conformable to the usage of great cities, when they prepare to make great feasts and public banqueting when as there are selected officers that are appointed to furnish every one according to his post and station. Such were the appointments of the king, who was not wanting to assist in person, and his people, to speak truth, were such as spared for no labor or pains to execute his orders, for with all alacrity and cheerfulness they provided whatever was necessary and requisite, putting in execution what the king required, with glad and cheerful hearts. Thus was the king's will exactly and freely complied with, in this and all other regards whatever. For Dorothea was very frank and bountiful, and very industrious in his charge and employment, which was principally to have a due regard to the accommodating these great and venerable men, not employing what had been formerly allotted to such uses, but fresh and valuable stuffs, sparing nothing that was in his power. He assigned every one of them his couch of ease, besides his bed, with fair carpets, as the king had commanded. Moreover, the king required the half of them should be placed and seated at the table, so as that they might front his person, and the other half distributed on each side his chair of state, omitting nothing which any way might do them honor, or contribute to their utmost content and satisfaction. After the seats of the table were duly fixed and proportioned for each, the king's command to Dorothea was that all those who came from Judea,
should have victuals distributed, and such as they affect, after the usage of their country, and appointment of their law, nevertheless, that they should want for no plenty or variety, as also for performing their oblations, vows, and sacrifices, according to the custom of their nation. After all these ceremonies, the king besought one of them, named Eleazar, the most aged of all those that came with us, to make his orisons, who, as he was very venerable, being then risen from his seat, began in this manner, the prayer of Eleazar, God Almighty fill thee, O king, with all goodness, and give grace to thy wife, and to thy children, and that thy plenty may be permanent, without alteration or change, all the course of thy life, and theirs. Hardly had he ended this prayer, but there followed a noise and acclamation of joy, with a pleasant murmur and applause, that lasted a pretty while. All things being thus disposed and prepared for jollity, all the company betook themselves to make good cheer, and those who waited on the table repaired readily to their several posts, which the controller had given them in charge. Amongst those who served at the table were the children of the king and all the most considerable peers and lords. The answers of the Jewish elders to the questions propounded by King Ptolemyus Philadelphus. When the time came and a fit opportunity offered for discourse, the king, by certain pauses, began to ask them one by one in order several questions, as they were marshalled at his table according to seniority. To him, therefore, that was set uppermost, he made this question. First question, how he should conserve his kingdom entire and safe to the end. The resolution. After the doctor had a little studied, he answered, You shall, great king, dispose the estate of your kingdom well and wisely, if in all, and by all. You propose to yourself the example of the benignity and indulgence of God for your imitation, using patience and gentleness, raising to honor those that are worthy, and bringing down the haughty and ambitious proud spirits to repentance, and a true sense of themselves, by giving them due example of humanity, affability, and fairness of access. To the other. Second question. How he might bring all things justly to a fair issue. The resolution. If in all things answered he, Great King, you have your eyes open, and thoughts fixed upon your actions, watching over yourself in all things. You will do nothing that will not be well done, and if you consider that a true sense of ourselves and right reason is no other than the gift of God, of whom we always ought to have the fear before our eyes, and present to all our operations, for that is the means never to go astray. To the other. Third question. How he should have friends agreeable to him. The resolution. If they know, great king, that you have no thoughts but what are employed upon that which is just and profitable, and conducing to the public good, and that you are excited to it by considering how God supplies the wants of mankind, providing sustenance for the necessities of the body, and for the necessities of life, bodily health, and other gifts and abilities. Fourth question. How he should acquire and conserve a solid reputation in expediting of affairs, in doing public justice, and punishing offenders. The resolution. If you carry yourself as reason and equity requires, indifferent to everyone's right, and if you proceed not against malefactors according to your uncontrollable power, or with partiality, you may get knowledge in this point if you bear in mind the providence and wise disposal of God, who granteth the requests and petitions of those are worthy, and to the malefactors and vicious. He shows them that he denies nothing but what is hurtful and which appears such by their own experience, or by the admonitions and terrors of dreams. Also he punisheth not the sins of men neither in proportion to their great demerits, nor to his almighty power, but rather courts their amendment, sweetly winning them by mild and gentle methods. To the other. Fifth question. What he should do to be invincible in war? The resolution. If you put not your trust in your warlike preparations, nor in your own strength, but if you call upon God incessantly to assist you in nothing but what is just, then will he direct and conduct your counsels and forces. To the other, sixth question, by what means he may make himself formidable to his enemies, the resolution, if you be provided of good artillery, and well disciplined, and have due regard to your stores and provisions, nevertheless that you keep not your eye wholly on your preparations, but raise it above them to God who pulls back his arm before he stretches it out, 
and then exerts it to our greater dread and amazement. To the other. Seventh question. What thing may be to him most advantageous and best in this life? The resolution. That is, great king, to have a constant apprehension that God is the sovereign ruler of all men, for we have not the power of ourselves to address our counsels to worthy ends, but it is God who ruleth over all things, that conducts and crowns with perfection the events of humane affairs. To the other. Eight question. By what means he might keep his treasure without diminution? and leave it unimpaired to his children. The resolution. If incessantly you pray to God, great king, that he will give you good advice and good understanding in what you are continually negotiating, and that you command your children not to boast themselves, or grow proud either of riches or honor, but that they acknowledge and persuade themselves that God hath bestowed all that they have, and what they enjoy is from his free gift and bounty, and that for their part they possess nothing which proceedeth from themselves to the other. Ninth question. By what means he may bear patiently good and evil fortune? The resolution. If you consider with yourself, great king, that all mankind are created of God, subject to this lot, to be afflicted with great misfortunes in the beginning, and after to arrive at prosperity, and so to share good and ill fortune alternatively. For there is no man in this world that is not subject to such variety, or is privileged from it. But it is requisite you pray to God that he will be pleased of his free goodness to reduce your kingdom to tranquility. The king then approving this reason, said, that they had answered all well and pertinently. But after, said he, I have made one demand yet more, I will leave questioning, because we may return to our rejoicing, passing the rest of this day in jollity. And six days hence we will bethink ourselves of such questions as we intermit at present. And so he put forth this question to another. Tenth question. What is the end of magnanimity? The resolution. It is to be content when there happens cross accidents after you have provided good counsel to arrive at the end of your affairs, for God giveth good success to negotiations that are conducted by good and proper counsel. This answer was received with acclamations and applauses by all the assistants, and the king turning himself towards the philosophers which were there in some number. I am, said he of opinion, that these men are excellently skilled in virtue, and that they have great experience in all things, being they have so readily and pertinently, upon the sudden, answered to such high questions, still founding their speeches always in God. Then a philosopher named Menedemus Eritriensis answered the king in this manner, Truly, sir, considering that man is a divine work, which one may know by the fabric of the whole world, it is a thing well beseeming and reasonably fitting that we begin with God and resolve into him all the force of our discourse. The king, approving his speech, all the company betook them to make cheer and to jollity, and so the feast lasted till night with great mirth and recreation. Upon the morrow the tables were disposed in the same order, and the banquet continued, and when occasion to make interrogatories was presented, the king began to address his countenance to those who, in the rank of answering, were next to those that the former day had been questioned, beginning at the eleventh, succeeding ten precedent. Eleventh question. What is the means to rule well and govern a kingdom happily? The resolution. That is, first to rule yourself well, and not suffer yourself to be transported through self-opinion by means of the affluence of worldly riches and honor, and not to aim at anything by oppression, or against right, through an imperious annoyance, which if you consider duly great king, and weigh well in your mind, esteeming all things as they justly are, you will reckon all that you possess as if it were nothing. Think also that God is full of all goodness, and stands not in need of anything, which thought you ought to fix deep in your mind as firmly as your humane spirit can contain it, and not too passionately to covet overflowing abundance of worldly greatness and riches, as thinking thereby to reign better. To the other. Twelfth question. How he ought to make choice of the best things. The resolution. If you have regard always to what is just and equitable, and if you esteem things unjust and wicked to be other than privation of life, for God hath ordained great and abundant goodness for just men. To the other. Thirteenth question how I may avoid the uneasiness that many times proceeds from dreams, the resolution. 
You ask me, great king, a most nice question, for such things as discompose the mind are out of rule, since we are sometimes led by our senses, arising either from what hath passed, or from the objects presenting themselves to our view. Whence many times we fancy in our dreams, we are sailing upon the sea, or are passing over rivers, many times that we fly aloft with wings, soaring from place to place, and such like things as are ridiculous even to waking thoughts. Moreover, things to which we have great appetite and desire, disturb our fantasy in dreams. Wherefore, great king, I am of opinion, that with all your might, in all you say and do, your intention should be purely addressed to piety and holiness, to the end, that persevering in that manner, you may be guided and fortified on all sides with virtue, and so show yourself impenetrable to all sensuality. And on the other side, that you never take by force from another what to him belongs of right, because the things wherein we most engage and employ ourselves waking commonly appear in phantoms to us again in our dreams, insinuated into our fancies by the appetites and inclinations we had to them. But when you level all your affections, operations, and affairs at the mark of virtue and honesty, then sleeping and waking you will be at ease. To the other. Fourteenth question. By what means he should do nothing indecently, the resolution. If in all things you consider what appertains to your degree, and what is in your power, to the end there fall not from you anything unbecoming your royal dignity, either in word or deed, you must also bear in mind that all your subjects are discoursing still of you, judging all your steps, and censuring your courses. Further, consider how you are exposed to flatterers, who dive into your very thoughts upon every change of your countenance and carriage, from which they will make use for their own ends. But in this, great king, you may well understand how to demean yourself, not submitting your ear to any person that may charm you with his siren flattery, or disguise the truth by dissimulation, since God hath endowed you with great affability of behavior, accompanied with gravity and dispatch. The king then received this answer with great joy and applause, and gave all the company leave to seek their repose, to prepare themselves for meeting at the feast the day following, which was ordered as the former. They being met, and the time presenting itself for discourse, as before, the king made this question to the first of those that had not yet spoken. Fifteenth question. What thing is most difficult for a king? The resolution, that is, to command himself and not to permit himself to be prevailed upon by any exorbitant appetites or passions. For all men have a certain bent of inclination by which they many times permit themselves to be led according as their genius leads them, some to banquets and riot, others to pastimes and pleasures, wherein the greatest part of the multitude are immersed. But kings should have their thoughts more elevated, as being excited by great honor and glory to frame their actions to conquests and design the taking of cities and reducing of nations. Nevertheless, it is very commendable to keep a mean, and to conserve carefully what God hath and shall give you, and not so much to affect what is out of reason or unworthy the high glory of your place. To the other, sixteenth question, what means he hath to avoid the envy of any, the resolution? If before all things you bear in mind that riches, honor, and greatness are the gifts of God to kings, of which no person hath true right to dispose. Wherefore, if any aim to partake of this glorious prerogative to be unenvied, he will never obtain his end, for it is the gift of God alone. To the other, seventeenth question, what he ought to do to oblige his enemies, the resolution, if you become gracious and favorable towards all bountiful persons, without particular respect of any, likewise in what you receive from others, not to show yourself ingrateful to the services and good offices you have received from them, for that is a sign of the grace of God. To the other. Eighteenth question. How he may continue in glory and honor. The resolution. If towards others, and above all others, you excel in bounty and magnificence, accompanying the same with a good grace, never will glory and honor abandon you, and it behoveth you still to pray to God that such virtues may perpetually assist you. To the other. Nineteenth question. To what persons he should dispense honor? The resolution. They commonly judge, great king, that we ought to dispense honor where we especially love. But for my part I am of opinion that we ought to dispense all we can to the envious, and to be gracious and bountiful to them, 
according to the utmost of our power, to the end that by such means they may be induced and won to do what is good and profitable, in which choice of our favours we must implore the aid of God who inspireth the understanding, to the end he may accomplish in us this perfection. To the other, twentieth question, what persons he ought to gratify, the resolution, father and mother, great king, before all persons, for God hath annexed a great commandment to the duty we owe to our father and mother, allowing after but a second place to friends, whom he hath still proportionable in nature. Further, I esteem it, great king, no small happiness, that you engage all the world to love you, to the other. One and twentieth question, what is more worthy than beauty, the resolution, that is piety, for that is a beauty excelling all other, and its force consisteth in charity, which is a gift of God, which you have, and with it you will inherit all virtue and all that is good, to the other. Two and twentieth question, by what means one may recover greatness and glory once lost, the resolution, that is great king, if you are full of benignity, affability, and gracious to all the world, which are things charming and attracting the love of the people, it is hard if you lose your greatness. On the other side, great preparations for war give great assurance, but those who fall into such accidents, it is necessary that they abstain from what occasioned them to fall into such inconveniences, and thenceforward they acquire friends by giving themselves to the exercise of justice and equity, for good works are the gifts of God. To the other, three and twentieth question, how he may live without anxiety, the resolution. If you wrong no man, and relieve every one, doing justice to all the world, for from so doing we reap such pleasant fruits as we shall always live pleasantly. Nevertheless, we ought to crave of God, that what accidents happen contrary to expectation, bring us no damage, as death, sicknesses, and such like inconveniences, which can do you no harm if you are full of piety, to the other. Four and twentieth question. What thing in this world is worthy the greatest honour, the resolution, that is, to serve God, not so much with sacrifices or oblations, as with a pure heart and a sincere conscience, and to conform yourself to the obedience of a simple and active faith, which if you do, great king, it will firmly imprint this truth in your heart, that all you have done, and shall do hereafter, will be evident and appear to all the world. After this passed, the king, with a loud voice, saluted them all, ascribing to them great praise, as did also the assistants, especially the philosophers, who were there present, and not without cause. For these persons were of great authority in all their speeches, laying the foundations of their answers and opinions always in God. This done, the king returned to feasting and merriment. The day following, the tables were covered in the same manner as before, and all the lords as before being set at table. The king, taking his opportunity of devising, began to interrogate those who followed the others in the foregoing day of answering, and made this question, the twenty-fifth question, I would know if prudence may be taught, the resolution, prudence is a certain dress and ornament of the soul, flowing from the divine power, having this property to embrace what is good, and to refuse its contrary. Six and twentieth question. What thing is most advantageous for the health of the soul? The resolution. That is prudence, which none can procure or obtain unless God disposes his understanding to receive it. To the other. Seven and twentieth question. How may one sufficiently yield due thanks to their father and mother? The resolution. If you give them no cause of grief in the world, though there's scarce any to be found who can so govern themselves, except in God, Father of all light, do illumine their understanding to every action, to the other. Eight and twentieth question, how he might be made covetous to hear many things. The resolution. If you consider, great king, how advantageous and profitable it is to know everything created, for by that means proportioning and adjusting what you have understood to the quality of the times present, you will have the choice of what will be most agreeable and convenient for you, in which you ought always to pray unto God, that he will be your succourer, for from him proceeds all accomplishment of good works. To the other, nine and twentieth question, what he should do not to violate the laws, the resolution. If you were persuaded that God hath inspired those who have established the laws, for the direction and government of the lives of U.S. mortals, you will well follow the, the other. 
Thirtieth question. What advantage may accrue to one from parentage? The resolution, great king, if we weigh the accidents which happen to us, we shall find. When our parents fall into adversity, we share with them therein, and are mutually oppressed and grieved with the greatness their sorrow. And if there arrive also any prosperity and happy fortune to them, we are glad, and find that content and satisfaction in which we solace ourselves. And in truth, our parents are so well advised that they can intermingle their affairs amicably together, and that all things between them be so well knit together by the ties of an inviolable friendship. There is no place left for any desire of a life more happy, nor is the same capable of any addition save only of continuance, which you are to beg of God. To the other, one and thirtieth question, how he might be free from all fear, the resolution. If your conscience be clear of all sense of past guilt, setting God always present before your eyes, for the guide and conduct of all your counsels to a good and happy issue, to the other. Two and thirtieth question. How he should be readily assisted with recollection and a due presence of mind at all times. The resolution. If you seriously reflect how to the vicissitudes of humane life all the world is exposed, setting often before your eyes the admirable revolutions that God hath sent, how some are raised to riches and honor, others pressed with calamities, and fallen into extreme disgrace, to the other. Three and thirtieth question. What course he ought to take and pursue to avoid being immersed in sensuality and idleness? The resolution. This to you, great king, who have the rule of a great kingdom, and a multiplicity of affairs to manage is feasible. For in the discharge of so weighty an employ me, it is impossible you should have any leisure to fix your imagination upon anything but your affairs, since they will take up all your time. It is convenient, therefore, that you be always intent upon your charge, and that you pray to God to give you grace to omit nothing of what concerns your employment. To the other. Four and thirtieth question. By what signs he may know those who would impose upon him the resolution. If you consider with yourself what freedom every one useth in your behalf, whether he hath ever used the same, and so continueth the same fashion still, to court you out of choice, or whether he gives you counsel only out of course, and that his conversation and manner of life be the same as before, and whether he hath forgot nothing of what the duty and affection which he owes you doth require. Briefly, if his affections and other fashions of proceeding are varied, God instruct your understanding to foresee the effect. Then the king commended them all, calling every one by his name, whereat all the assistants rejoiced. The next day, when the king espied his fit opportunity in the feast, he began to question the rest, as follows. Five and thirtieth question. What is the greatest neglect in the world? The resolution. It is to take no account of our children, and not to take due care for their education, to train them up in virtue, and to form in them good manners and behavior, for in our common devotions we entreat God not only for ourselves, but also that it would please Him to address our children to all goodness, and to impart wisdom and science to them, which proceeds also from the grace of God. To the other. Six and thirtieth question. How he should come to be a lover of his country. The resolution. If you persuade yourself that it is a happy thing to live and die at home, and that travels bring nothing but folly to the poor, and dishonor to the rich. Since most men are of opinion that travelers have been banished their country for some miscarriage, debt, or trespass. But you, great king, will easily obtain what you demand in doing well, as you do to all the world, for God will give you a happy issue in all your just affairs and actions. To the other, seven and thirtieth question, what course one ought to take, to live agreeably with his wife, the resolution. Although some kind of women are nice and troublesome, and through their being opiniators grow perverse, being also frail, by reason of the weakness of the sex, and subject to commit some faults, yet nevertheless it behoveth us to comply with them, and to use them for our advantage, not striving with them, nor contradicting them with a forward spirit, for it is necessary to address our life to a certain but or end, as the governors and pilots of ships do in observing landmarks, which steps are all conducted by the order and providence of our great God. To the other, eight and thirtieth question, what course he should take not to be deceived? The resolution. If you act in every occasion according to reason, 
you will not suffer yourself to be led away by the insinuations of detractors, but as you are endowed with a discerning spirit, you will put a difference betwixt the deeds and sayings of everyone, by which means you will be out of danger of being circumvented, accomplishing your desires in every design which you shall lay with assured judgment. Nevertheless, you must imagine that the skill of ordering every affair, the carrying it on, and the event of it, is the work of the divine power. To the other, nine and thirtieth question, what he should do to avoid being choleric, the resolution. If you consider, great king, that he on whom the lives of many depend is the occasion of a multitude of deaths, when he executeth his will with fury and passion, and it is a detestable thing to extinguish the lives of many out of an affectation of power, for when subjects conform themselves to the will of the prince, humbly yielding and complying, what ground hath he to disquiet himself, and to enter into passion? Moreover, he must remember that God, who guideth and governeth the universal world, is no way subject to wrath, nor heated with passion, whose example the prince ought to copy in his benign and gentle disposition. To the other, fortieth question, what thing is that which may well be foreseen by due precaution, the resolution? that is to measure all things duly by the line and balance of right reason, and to conduct them to their intended end and issue, and to reject whatever is unprofitable and impertinent, as contrary to right reason, in such sort, as sounding the intention in every proceeding, we come to the head of our affairs, by good counsel. But the divine virtue renders all counsel assured and firm, and yours principally, because you are given to the exercise of piety, to the other. One and fortieth question, what is it to play the philosopher, the resolution, that is, well and wisely to deliberate and consult all things that present themselves and happen to us, and not to suffer ourselves to be swayed by our irregular and fond appetite, but to despise all vanities and follies arising from filthy lust and sordid lucre, and to be always ready to the accomplishment of all good works, by as good and just measures which to attain. We ought to implore the aid of God incessantly. To the other, two and thirtieth question, what is the royal virtue of hospitality? The resolution. It is to show oneself not ingrateful, but bountiful to all the world, repaying with increase the good turns you have received from another, in such sort as you may bear away the prize of courtesy. For God greatly exalteth the humble bearing great favor and love to those that lessen and impoverish themselves liberally to raise the virtue of others. To the other. Three and fortieth question, what works are of most duration? The resolution. He is esteemed to do a lasting work, who hath brought to pass a weighty business and worthy of regard, and when it is such as the beholders durst not put their hands to it, by reason of the difficulty and excellency of the affair, and that he nevertheless suffers none that have labored in it to be unrewarded not omitting likewise, to feed with such as he hath obliged to engage therein, with all necessaries. God, having regard of all things in this world, enriches men with variety of gifts, allotting to some health of body, and of understanding, and many such goods. Wherefore, great King, you, in the imitation of God, ought to comfort the afflicted, and to convert their calamities into solace and repose, as being assured that whatever is done by justice and equity, is most permanent and lasting, to the other. Four and fortieth question. What is the fruit of wisdom, the resolution? The fruit of wisdom is, when we have committed nothing whereof our conscience doth knowingly reproach us, and when we have passed the course of our lives sincerely. For by such means, excellent king, there is bred in our minds a very great satisfaction, and an infinite joy, with a pleasant complacence. For you, great king, can never want hope in God, conducting your reign in true piety and religion. These answers heard, all the assistants expressed signs of great approbation, crowned with a cheerful applause. Then the king graciously invited them to drink. The morning after, when all the company returned to the table, the king asked the rest in the following manner, five and fortieth question, what course he should take never to be elated with pride, the resolution. You will never be swelled nor elated with pride, if you keep yourself in an equality and moderation of spirit, that is to say, if upon all occasions you have this maxim engraven in your mind, 
that you who bear rule over men are no more than a man yourself, reflecting also with yourself that God infatuated the proud and arrogant and raiseth those who are lowly and humble. To the other. Six and fortieth question. What counselors he ought to have about him? The resolution. They should be your counselors, great king, who have been long exercised and versed in your affairs. And such as you know bear you great fidelity and love and who know how to conform and suit themselves to your condition, the light of God will discover those who are worthy such an employment to the other. Seven and fortieth question. What is most necessary to a king? The resolution, the love of his subjects, for by that means he will make a bond of indissoluble goodwill. For the rest, God accomplisheth that which one chooseth for the best. To the other. Eight and fortieth question. What is the end of a speech? or oration in pleading, the resolution. It consists, after you have proposed your intention, in persuading that your cause is good, confuting the objections of your adversary, and showing them to be inconsequent, worthless and impertinent. But the main end is to pursue duly the point on every occasion, and not to stray with locutions, for the true persuasion is a thing addressed from God. To the other, nine and fortieth question how he should accommodate himself to divers people in one kingdom, the resolution, doing and administering justice to every one equally, and by so doing you shall govern and rule them as you list. For the rest, God inspireth men with power to discern the right of kings. To the other, fiftieth question, in what things are we constrained to be sorrowful, the resolution, in the calamities and adversities of our friends, and most, when we see that such calamities are of a long durance and inevitable, and when they are therewith so attacked as to cause them to die, for in such griefs there is no means how we can take off our sorrow, and if there were, there is no possible hope of remedy, nor any profit to be found against such accidents, with which all humane kind are so grieved. For to avoid wholly all mischances is a business rather for a divine power than a mortal. To the other, one and fiftieth question, in what thing a man deprives himself of glory and honor? The resolution, when a man becomes untractable and inaccessible by fierceness and pride, for then vituperation comes upon him, and privation of honor follows him. For God, who is the governor of glory, gives and takes it away, as seemeth good to him. To the other, two and fiftieth question, what kind of men he ought most to trust? The resolution to those who bear you such love, that neither fear, nor avarice, nor ambition, nor covetousness, nor hope of lucre, cannot at all have any power to divert. Nevertheless, the show of this love is not easily to be discerned, and in the same, it is needful to have observation a long time, for those who are near to a king aspire to make themselves rich, and spare no means to get, by his favor, great profit, and are naturally traitors. But God conduct great king, your counsel, that they may sufficiently show you who are those that perfectly love you. To the other, three and fiftieth question, what is that which conserveth a kingdom? The resolution, that is, that the king take diligent care, and give order, that those who are in office, and have charge, commit no undue things to the prejudice of the people, the which you know very well how to perform, for, as it seemeth, God hath given you a spirit very excellent. To the other. Four and fiftieth question. By what means he might keep grace and honor? The resolution. By virtue, for she is the accomplishment of all great works, and trips up the feet of vice, as you have long experimented by your excellent bounty towards all persons, which in you is a sign of the gift of God. To the other. Five and fiftieth question how in time of war he might keep himself still in tranquility of spirit. The resolution. If you propose in your mind to give order that your lieutenants and captains commit nothing that is evil, but that they contend by virtue one with another for the proof of their virtue, and further, that they have in you a perfect confidence that you will have their domestic affairs in a singular respect, if it happen that they lose their lives for, and in your service, by this means you shall have no occasion to be troubled, disposing all prudently by divine clemency, which will inspire you to understand all that is good. King Ptolemy receiving this answer with great expressions of joy, 
with a cheerful countenance entreated them all to drink, showing extreme content and satisfaction. The seventh day, the feast was prepared more great and more sumptuous than it had hitherto been, because that many ambassadors from cities were arrived there. Then all being set in their order, the king finding occasion to devise, asked the first of those that had not yet spoken their advice in this same manner. Six and fiftieth question. How he might be resolved thoroughly by reason, and by arguments, the resolution. If you weigh well the propositions which you shall hold, and the persons which speak, and the subject whereof they treat, and that you often inform yourself, and that in divers manners, and by long intervals of time, of the estate of the above said affairs. For the bounty of the Spirit is an extraordinary gift of God, by which one may easily know and discern all things. To the other, seven and fiftieth question, wherefore is it that many cannot approach unto virtue? The resolution, because nature hath created all humane creatures subject to incontinence, and prompt to voluptuousness, from whence injustice and iniquity is engendered, and avariciousness does greatly abound. But the estate of virtue whose nature is fixed on things sublime, casts away all those whom voluptuousness doth cause to be alienated from her. For she commends before all things, that justice and magnanimity shall be observed, the which God gives, and is therefore the principal author. To the other. Eight and fiftieth question. What is that which kings ought to follow above all things? The resolution. That is the laws. To the end that they ruling the lives of subjects by just and equitable acts, as we have heard you do, great king, you shall gain by this means immortal memory, if you follow the precepts and commands of the Most High. To the other. Nine and fiftieth question. Who are those that one ought to elect for offices and magistracies? The resolution. They are those that are averse to all things unjust and that are imitators of your actions, and that being drawn with the sweetness of virtue, pursue incessantly after good works, that they may attain to glory and honor, to which certainly, O worthy king still following virtue, you will attain, for God is he that crowneth with honor and glory glorious justice. To the other, the sixtieth question, what persons ought one to choose for captains? The resolution. Those that do most exceed justice and magnanimity, and yet have more respect to the lives of men than to a bloody victory. For God is he from whom all mortals receive infinite goodness, the which you shall excellently imitate, if you persist in doing good to your subjects, to the other, the one and sixtieth question. Who is the man worthy of admiration? The resolution. That is he who doth highly abound in glory and greatness, is opulent in riches, and sublime in puissance yet nevertheless yields himself affable and kind, just and equitable to everyone, as we have heard, great king, you do, and the same shall make you admired by every one, for it is God that hath engraven this solicitude in your heart. To the other, the two and sixtieth question, what behoveth him to exercise himself in, when he is at leisure, that he may not thereby be drowned in sloth? The resolution. It is necessary with all imaginable care and diligence to consider the discourse which offer concerning the form and manner of living, which every one ought constantly to have before his eyes. Likewise, to bear always in mind to what end property and virtue were all things ordained, because in the said discourse there is much good and honest pastime conjoined to the increase of knowledge. For amongst little and vile things, one finds many times something that may please him to choose and take. For the rest, great king, it seems well to us, God hath in a great measure so favoured you, that you will still be electing all virtuous behaviour and kindness, by the great honour you bear to the study of wisdom. To the other, the three and sixtieth question, in what things ought kings most to employ their time? The resolution, in the knowledge of histories, and in reading books, which treat of affairs, that most often present themselves to him, in which it is needful that he employ much time. It behoveth, moreover, that he inquire for those writings that teach to conserve kingdoms, and to correct the manners of men, which to accomplish with such diligence as you do, God will give prosperity to your designs, in which he will grant you in excellent glory far above other kings. To the other, the four and sixtieth question. What persons ought one to invite to banquets? The resolution. 
One ought to call those which are desirous to learn, and those who often think how the affairs of a kingdom ought to pass, and that know how to recount the lives of princes, for there is nothing more pleasant nor more delectable than such company, for they are those that are well instituted and instructed in the beauty of knowledge, and have God in high reverence. The which thing it seems you do accomplish well, great king, as one may perceive, in that God hath been pleased to send you prosperity and happiness in all your affairs. To the other, the five and sixtieth question, which is most profitable for the people, either to choose over them a king from a private person, or to obey a king that was son to a king. The resolution, the most profitable to the people, is that which is most agreeable with nature. For although that some king's sons be sometimes oppressors of the people, yet those which from private persons come to be exalted to such sublimity and greatness, because they have experienced poverty, and endured calamities and laborious travels of private persons, they are more cruel than bloody tyrants, and rule their subjects by force and intolerable violence. Wherefore the ordinance received and accustomed, and the common fashion of doing, is much more sure, and far better for government, that it come from the king by succession, from father to son, as it is with you, worthy and great king. For your greatness and excellency consisteth not so much in honours, glory, and great domination, as in clemency and benignity. The which, by a gift from God, draweth and attracteth the hearts of all persons to love you. The king accepted this answer with praise, and turned himself towards the last, saying, The six and sixtieth question, What is most profitable to a kingdom? The resolution, that is, to hold and maintain the people in peace, and to give order that suits and process of law should be immediately, and without delay a judge definitively, for such things are executed when the prince hateth the wicked, and showeth favour and kindness to good and honest men and such as be virtuous, and that he esteems it a great thing to have saved the life of one of his subjects. As we have been informed you do, great king, that abhor all murderers, disposing and tempering all by justice, in which you adorn to eternity the greatness of your deeds, God having inspire you with a soul free from all foulness of vice, and illustrated the same with most excellent virtue. After these answers, there arose a great noise of congratulations and applauses with an excessive joyful acclamation, and the whole hall was full of joyful shouts. The king then commanding silence, and taking his cup, invited them all to drink, then addressing his speech to the said doctors, pronounced these words in the presence of all the assembly. I repute this day, my masters, to be to me most happy by your presences. For your answers have brought to me most great profit and instruction for the government of myself and my kingdom. Thus all being ended, he ordained that to every one of the doctors should be delivered three talents of silver, and by and by gave to every one of them a page to wait upon them at their table. So with great contentment to everyone, the feast was ended with great praise of the king's liberality, who above all showed a countenance of receiving the greatest satisfaction and most joyful content. I have been hitherto philocrates, thus prolix in the recital of the business, which I have done, for the great esteem I have had of such men, and of their wisdom, marvelling at the readiness of their answers, being so pertinent to that which was proposed to them upon the sudden, showing such elegance in their speech, as if these questions had been long time in premeditation, and that he who proposed them had thought of them long before he demanded them and yet their answers to him were found so agreeable, as if they had long before consulted together about them. Wherefore it is no wonder that they seem admirable, not to me only, but to the philosophers also, and to all them that were present, assuring you that such things are more hard to believe than one would imagine, in which I will not wonder, if the faith of the readers be vanquished. For my part, what occasion have I to add dreams or falsities, seeing that all which I have written is to be found in the registers of the king, where it is held the greatest of crimes, to find any untruth in the least thing of the world. I assure you, then, that this recitation is most true, containing the discourse of all the things as they have passed in verity, without mixture of any error, for to this end, that I might best know the truth. I have used this diligence to search public registers, where we may see recited the banquets and feasts, together with the interrogations also of the king, and the answers which were given him, 
and all even word for word, from whence I have borrowed what I have here written. For you know it hath been the custom to register and enroll all that hath been done and said, every day from the time that the king began to give audience, unto the time he went to bed, without omitting anything that he did, or was said to his majesty, a course truly, very profitable and well instituted. For by that means the registered acts of the precedent day being read, if anything were omitted in what the king had said or done, there might be opportunity of amendment. Therefore, after I had diligently searched the day book of the king, I have collected the same for you, here by writing, as aforesaid, well knowing the extraordinary great desire you have to understand all remarkable occurrences, the means used by the seventy-two doctors in their interpreting or translating the law. Three days after these feasts and disputes were ended, Demetrius conducted all these doctors towards the sea, into an isle, and entering upon a bank, passed a bridge which led towards the north, where the place designed for this assembly was, and where they should hold their conference for their interpretation of the law. It was a house of pleasant situation, and most magnificent, upon the banks of the sea, very stately and curiously decked and trimmed, where, above all conveniences, there was great silence for the tranquillity of the spirit, and repose of the understanding. Moreover, there was all things necessary for life, carefully provided and prepared with great convenience and ease. In this place Demetrius entreated them they would dispose themselves to the interpretation of the law, in which they began to proceed, disputing and conferring together of everything, until they came all to one general accord and consent, to resolve in a true sense advisedly. The which done, they set down in writing, that which was by them so composed and reduced into good order, the most learnedly, and the most eloquently that they could, by the advice and counsel of all. They put it apart, that the same might afterwards be put into the hands of Demetrius. Their colloquies and conferences lasted from the morning until nine of the clock, and so rising from these disputes, they went to take recreation and air for their health. After all things were sumptuously administered unto them. For Dorothea, who had the same in charge, was therein so careful, that there was nothing made ready for the king's person, but every day they had as much of the same to every single person. And he would once the day come to visit them with courtship in his own proper person, and they sometimes went to salute the king with great reverence, and so returned to privacy. Every morning it was their custom to make their prayers to God, after they had washed their hands in the sea, as the Jews customarily use lavations, and then retired to their readings and interpretations. I was so bold to ask them why they so washed their hands before they made their prayers, to which demand they made this answer, that this washing of the hands did admonish them to do nothing wickedly, but to devote all their actions to piety and sanctity, because that all the works they did with their hands might be effected according to justice, truth, and cleanness, as we have before said. To conclude, these personages being in such serenity of air, beauty of dwelling, tranquility of silence, pleasantness of repose, and royal entertainment, finished the work undertaken. And, which is a note of admiration, they had so expressly ordered it among themselves, and followed it with such care and diligence, that the interpretation of the law was fully finished in the space of seventy-two days. Demetrius, then seeing the translation and interpretation of the law, was so well and happily brought to an end, used means that the multitude of the Jews, then being in Egypt, might be convocated to the place where the work was then perfected, to whom he showed how all things had been done, beginning with all circumstances of the enterprise, and all in the presence of the interpreters. To the king all the multitude attributed great praise, and gave infinite thanks for being the mediate cause of so important a good, and a benefit of such excellency. Likewise they shared a part of the honour to Demetrius, entreating him to show them that favour as to have a copy for their princes, for to have their advice, and to deliberate upon the profit or damage that might arise upon the same. In this sort was the law reviewed, renown, and received in the assembly of the princes of the Jews, and of the multitude, and of the ambassadors of towns. And upon proclamation made the seventy-two doctors being present, that all was well and hollowly translated, and done after a most exquisite manner. It was provided that nothing thereof should be changed, and that all things should remain in the same estate 
without alteration of the least thing or tittle. As the translation was thus approved of all, and the decree made for the ratification of the same, Demetrius commanded that according to their custom, they should make imprecations and maledictions against those which should undertake or should presume to add anything thereto, or to transfer it other ways by changing, effacing, or ordering anything whatsoever it were, unto that which was so perfectly now written. And when all was perfected and accomplished in this manner, he adjured the Jews to hold, keep, and preserve it inviolably for ever, the which they promised to do with great joy and acclamation. So Demetrius, finding himself greatly satisfied, especially because he had been a great conductor of the work, and that he had given to the king such content in the happy execution and accomplishment of his charge, and of this his felicity, made great compliments to the king, who, having after with great diligence perused this interpretation, and considered the profundity of the sense of the lawmaker, which he admired with an astonished regard, he said to Demetrius, How comes it to pass that none of the poets or historians have put their hands to this law, being it is a thing of so high and perfect excellency? To which Demetrius answered, That nobody never durst touch it, as well for the reverence of the same, as also that God had forbidden it, so as some having presumed to attempt it, have been chastised with divine punishment, whereupon they have been constrained to desist from their enterprise, for, as testifieth Theopompus, which, by a recital of himself, saith, that presuming to transfer into his history some secrets of the holy law, he was afflicted more than thirty days following with a perturbation of his understanding, but calling upon God in the intervals and cessations of the most vehement fits of this his malady, it was told him in his sleep, this punishment was sent him from God, for having presumed to profane and falsify things sacred. So by this vision he was corrected, repented, and perfectly received his senses again. And, said Demetrius, upon mine own knowledge, I affirm that Theodorus, a tragic poet, willing to usurp something from this law, therewith to enrich his posy, lost his sight. Nevertheless, advising with himself, and concluding that this his audaciousness was the cause of his blindness, prayed to God for many days, whereby he came again to health. The king, saying that this was wisely spoken, adored the law, commanding that the books of the same should be preserved the most curiously and carefully that might be possible, and advising with the interpreters, benignly and graciously prayed them, that when they were in Judea, they would often come and see him. Finally, he gave order, that they should be honorably returned back and conducted into their country, promising them, that how oft soever, and when they pleased to return. He would entertain them as his principal friends, so honoring them with fair presence according to their merits, and commanding that all things should be made ready for the dispatch of their return, using towards them all royal magnificence. He gave to every one of them three rich habiliments, and two talents of gold, and an excellent cup of the weight of a talent. Moreover, furniture to furnish a chamber, over and above he sent to Elisa ten table beds or couches of ease, which had the feet of silver, and adorned with all that was necessary to the beautifying of them. Further, he sent him a present of thirty talents of Cilicia, that is to say, ten robes, whereof the one was of purple, and a fair crown of an hundred tunics of crespi, of vials, of basins, and two cups of gold for the sacrifices. After, he entreated Eleazar, that when any of the said doctors should desire rather to return to him than to remain in Jerusalem, that he would not hinder them by any means. For he protested he made great esteem of wise men's company, and that he would spare for nothing to draw them to him, in which he should best employ his riches, to all imaginable content and profit, and not, as some prodigal princes do, in vain trifles that profit nothing. Behold here, my Philocrates, the present which I promise you, in which I hope, you will take more pleasure than in reading vain, fabulous narrations, being that you use to wet and sharpen your understanding in the contemplation of the most great and noble actions, in which you have employed much time, which hath given me occasion now to write you things worthy and excellent, and the best that I could choose, because that betwixt us I would kindle a kind contention and emulation of amiable virtue, for the desire to have an intelligence of things more worthy to be observed, 
and which are the most excellent. The end of Aristus his history, proofs concerning this history, now follows sundry opinions of divers authors, ancient and modern, concerning this business and translation of the law of Moses, and first, an extract from the fourth chapter of the fifth part of the several collections of Pietro Messi, in which there fell, saith he, an admirable and miraculous hap, viz. How the seventy-two interpreters being put severally into several cells, by the commission of the king, without possible means to confer the one with the other, and that after they had made, so separated, every one his traduction, and being brought all together before the king with all their traductions, nevertheless were all found so conformable, that there was not one syllable more in the one than in the other, which could not be without the especial grace and operation of the Holy Ghost, as saith St. Augustine, Irenaeus, and Tertullian, who saith, he had seen in his time, and in Alexandria, the very books written by the hands of the seventy-two translators, which were in Hebrew and in Greek. As much also saith Justin the philosopher, in the book of his advertisements, that he made to the pagans and Gentiles, where he saith, that King Ptolemus made to be built, without the city of Alexandria, seventy-two halls, to lodge severally the seventy-two traductors, and there provided very honorably for them all. Of all that to them was necessary, in the which place the said translators remained, without one seeing the other, until that such their translations were perfectly finished. And he affirmeth also, to have seen then the ruins and old walls of these buildings, which were kept as relics and things sacred. And although St. Hierom and Raphinus agree not in the number of the said chambers, the matter is not great, seeing that according to St. Augustine, and many other authors, every translator made his translation apart, without conference with the other, yet all the traductions were found conform. And truly, however, when it is duly considered, it appears a great mystery, and may be held for a great miracle of this conformity of style and of order, to translate a thing so long and so diverse. Although all the translators had been together, and that they had begun this work at this time, for we see that it is enough for two men to accord in one only point when they are to mix something together. After the translation was finished, the Jews that remained in Egypt, and which had been versed in their law, recommended to the king this holy writing, wherewith the king was right well content. And for certain, according to Josephus and Eusebius, King Ptolemy was astonished at the holy scriptures, and ravishingly taken with their mysteries, that he demanded of Demetrius Phalerius, who had the charge of his library, saying, How comes it that Lycurgus, Solon, and other lawgivers are so silent of the law of the Jews? To whom Demetrius answered, saying, Sir, this law, as you may sufficiently see, comes from God, so that no lawgiver durst be so hardy to touch it, or take from it any tract. For even Theopompus was strucken by the divine hand with perturbation of his sense, and with a cardiac passion, for having a will to mix the holy history of the Hebrews, by his enriching it with eloquent words and rhetorical colors. But after returning to God, and commending himself to his mercy, it was revealed to him in a dream that his disaster came upon him for so attempting to embellish, and as he thought to enrich the sincerity of the holy scriptures with dress words and trimmed phrases, and to communicate it so to the pagans and infidels. It comes also into my thought how Theodorus, a tragic poet, suddenly lost his sight, for having taken one only passage of holy writ for argument of his tragedy, but repenting him of the same, and doing penance for his forfeit, he recovered his sight as before. Hitherto are the words of Pietro Messi, by the which we may see the diversity of opinions that is amongst authors concerning this translation of the law of Moses. For myself, it seemeth to me, that Aristeus, which was always present, and that had conduced to the affair in part, meriteth that one do him the honour to give belief to his history. Although some doctors therein vary, a short discourse of the antiquity and dignity of the sacred books, and excellency of their inspired writer, the prophet Moses, by the English translator. As the true God is the ancient of days and times, so it pleased him that his perpetual history contained in holy scriptures, should excel in antiquity of time. All other histories and writings of the world that can be found, the writings of the pagans, and nations, being all under these, 
and long after, and that only of Moses, the subject of this former history, contains the account of years justly from the creation and beginning of the world, even unto the coming of the promised Redeemer. A reckoning, I say, so just and certain, that there is no such to be found. For to come to the time wherein the prophet of God, Moses, the first writer of Holy Writ, began to write manifestly under the Lord of heaven and earth, we may gather, and without prejudice, of all that then could be done, as by a passage, amongst many other places, we read of in the seventeenth chapter of the book of Exodus, where it is said, God commanded him to write, and that in the same year the people of Israel issued out of Egypt, which was from the creation of the world 2513, upon which we may advertise ourselves, that the years are calculated according to verity of the said scriptures, by the faithful servants of God, which have happily travelled therein, and therefore we need not rest upon the calculation of histories, annals, and humane chronicles, or other writers that have not entirely followed holy scriptures, who are discordant amongst themselves, and many times directly opposite to one another's times. Therefore, if we diligently search all antiquities and writings of men of all nations, that have any appearance of certain time, wherein those writings were made, and after confer those times with the things recited and unregistered by the holy prophet Moses, and the time wherein he writ them, we shall see manifestly the excellency and antiquity that he is here in above all men. For the fables and disguisements of profane poets, Greeks and Latines, which all came a long time after Moses, amongst them, I say, we shall see no other but manifest dreams, lies, and amongst other things notable, some corruptions of the sacred scriptures, long before written, of which, they having heard some inkling, and received it as from hand to hand, or drawn it from his writings, or heard it recounted by the father to the son, and they from their ancestors, which were the children and successors of the three sons of Noah, who was the second father of humane kind, and restorer of the nations of all the world, all issuing from his posterity, after the universal flood. His three sons, as holy scripture hath acquainted us with, were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, of whom are descended all the earth, and this before spoken, is easily and sufficiently discovered in the writings of the said pagans, by the proper names of the said children of Noah, and of their successors, which of long time before these writings and profane histories had been named by Moses. For the pagans testify that the people had made of these ancient fathers idols and gods. As of Japhet, Japetus, they drew Javan, Janus, and Ion, and because they were names held in the Hebrew letters, or value of them, they accommodated them to their tongues and letters, and to make them more easy and glib in their accustomed pronunciation, came near, but with alteration. And if we will go more high, and weigh the old times of the first age which preceded the flood, as we have it from that only history of Moses in the Holy Bible, we shall easily perceive that the pagan poets and writers have received even the ancient names, and mingled them amongst their fables and dreams, and drawn them from the holy scriptures. And so it shall appear plainly that their false god, Vulcan, is not very hard to unmask, that he was a mortal man, and one of the sons of the other Lamech, the prime bigamist and corrupter of marriage, who descended of that accursed race of Cain, and this appears by the faculty of this Vulcan, which was a smith or forger of armor. And Moses declares him so, and by his name too, for he is by him called Thu Vulcan. And every one anything skilled in the Hebrew knows that if they leave the first letter, which is servile, and put to form the name, according to the manner of the Hebrews, it will appear mere Vulcan, for their letter Beth, B, having not a prick in him, is pronounced as our V consonant, and for the name of Vulcan's wife, by Moses called Nihama, which signifieth fair in their language, or, as speak the Latins, Venusta. It is a plain course to discover vain beauty, or their so much celebrated, unchaste, and wanton Venus, a goodly race and fair family, of that accursed murderer, Cain. And here may we see some of the proper gods and idols of the poor pagans, amongst that anthill of such and other ill-stolen names, unhandsomely fetched from the holy scriptures, with and by the subtlety of the devil, to the end that a wicked troop of execrable giants, violent oppressors of men, 
thieves, and adulterous desperates shaken off, and damned by the word of God, of whom the first apostate and Leah, Sathan, made his counterfeit gods and idols, the old serpent, expert and knowing in all malice, that there was no better way for him to muffle and blind humane judgment from the knowledge of the true God, at first engraven in the souls of men, but by this counterfeit device with posterity, but to pass farther in our begun purpose, touching the fabulous writings of the pagan poets, we shall find that their discourse, in the best we can of it, is but corruptions of the truth, in the holy scriptures of God, or things therein revealed, turned by them into dreams and profane narrations, as we may see, in that they writ of the creation of the world and government of the same of the divine virtue that sustains and interiorly nourisheth all things, of the consumption of heaven and earth with fire at the last day, and also of the restoration of the world, and of all things in such good order, for all so many confusions proceeding from sin, all which things they might obtain, and by some dark means draw from the books of holy scripture and sacred prophets, translated out of Hebrew into other languages or understand something by means of the dispersion of the people of Israel, spread through all the provinces of the Roman Empire, and through all the quarters of the world. For the Jews had for the most part leave in all places to hold their synagogues, and to have public lectures of their law and prophets. When these poets, flatterers of men, turned all that, spoken of the person of Christ, the promised Redeemer, and that then was expected falsely to apply them by flattery to their princes, false gods and idols. But let us leave all those jugglers and liars that durst be so profanely bold to corrupt the pure verity of God's word, and speak we of the Gentiles' writings, how long they came after Moses, and writ since he, and that even they have given testimony to him and his divine writings, which may at least suffice to convince all contradictors, that Moses was in nature and before them all. We understand that his reckoning is a perpetual following all the years since the creation of the world, even unto his time, as it is easy to gather by his books and his account of the years, and lives of the first fathers, from Adam unto the patriarch Abraham, and after, from his successors, as from father to son, to wit, Isaac, Jacob, Levi, Kath, Amram, and then Aaron and Moses himself, children of the said Amram and that he had express charge to write to the very last, the year since the creation of the world, 2513. And of his life the eighty, year, and hath continued his holy stories, even to the year of his death, and of the world, 2553. Now since that time, God hath always so provided for the advancement of his glory, and the edification of his church, that the perpetual history of her, and the certain account of the years of the world, hath been continued and still put in writing by his prophets, as it is to be seen in the holy books that treat of and contain the government of Joshua and the judges, then to Samuel and the kings of the people, unto the transmigration into Babylon, and of other governors which have succeeded them after their return from thence. And finally, the prophet Daniel hath declared the rest of the time, that is, the four hundred and ninety years since the said deliverance of the Jews, and return from Babylon, by the means of Cyrus, king of Persia, even to the death and resurrection of Christ the Redeemer, promise to the Holy Fathers, which is our Lord Jesus, the eternal Son of God, true God, and true man, who appeared living after his death and resurrection to more than five hundred faithful witnesses at one time, besides his other manifestations, and mounted visibly into heaven in the year of the world, 3,961. Now, if we will lurch all the histories of all the nations of the world, of whom the writings are arrived to our age, the most ancient time of which they make mention shall be of their antient destruction of Troy by the Greeks. The history whereof hath been written by Dictus of the Isle of Crete, which is the best testimony they have for the present, and since, by Homer and many others. And from this destruction, Diodorus Siculus, renowned amongst the historians, began his books, now the same, according with the common judgment and calculation of knowing men, comes only to be about three hundred and fifty-eight years before the building of Rome, the same time then falls to be in the sixteenth year of the government of Elon, judge of the people of Israel. 
mentioned in the book of Judges, and the same was three hundred and sixteen years before the first Olympiad, the reckoning of the annals of the Greeks, so then the said destruction of Troy falls to be only under the year of the world 2838, when therefore we shall give consent that their writings, the most certain, whose narrations we may best give credit unto, yet the prophet Moses shall be found much more ancient than all the writers of the world, what nations soever, though they are in great number, and of whom we see yet the old books in these last times in their proper tongues, and that he hath put his hand to the pen, and began to write his divine revelations of the creation and conduct of the world, even to his time and his sacred history and prophesies touching the church of God shall at least be three hundred and twenty-five years before all other writers, of whom there is any mention or news in the world, that is to say, in the year of the world, twenty-five thirteen. Whereupon we note, even to this present, against all those profane mockers that have disgorged that enormous blasphemy amongst others, that the world is eternal and of itself, which if it were, so as they dream, and that it had no such beginning as is written by Moses, they might find then by all, and in all languages, many histories of infinite times, and many chronicles of many ages, and of old times that have preceded Moses in the account of years. But we see that there is no such, and that the Holy Bible is found even in the middle amongst all sorts of enemies that strive to destroy, lose, abolish, burn, and extermine from the world the books of it, and for all thereto they had so long time, yet nevertheless they never could, nor ever shall. For we see the said Bible yet, in his proper writing and language, and of all others of what nation soever, the most celebrated and renowned. And if they could find any history, which had been written before Moses was born into the world, yet shall it contain their time and composition, with more years and ages, as we can gather from the Holy Scriptures, even to this present year 1633, since the Nativity of Christ the which account of times past from the creation unto this present year, shall come to amount to five thousand, five hundred and sixty-three years, but such histories neither can be found, nor ever were. But for Moses, and his faithful writings, even profane authors and histories of the Gentiles themselves, have been, even as it were, divinely constrained to bear testimony, maugree their calumnies, lies, dreams, and disguisings, through and by the invincible force of truth. And so they have served for certificates to all nations of the venerable and well-known antiquity of him and his holy writs, for some of them have noted and writ thus, as a thing notorious of their times to wit, that in the east parts, and of Syria itself, there had been an Abraham, an Israel, and even a Joseph, who, say they, was a son of the said Israel, sold by his brethren, and led into Egypt then how he was received into the court, and held very dearly with the king, to whom he foretold the grievous and great famine, so as without the divine counsel by him given. Whereupon the admonished king gathered up and made reservation of corn before the time of the said famine, Egypt had perished. And finally, how his successor Moses, and all his people issued out of Egypt, came to Mount Sinai, how they consecrated the seventh day for their Sabbath, or resting day, but I will leave this discourse, though diversified from a spark of truth, that these historians have mixed with their own devices, as profane, and in which they were poorly advertised and deceived, by the subtlety of Satan, as we may well know by conferring their writings with the Holy Bible. And be it that these scoffers of God and His Holy Word dare be so bold to say and affirm that Moses and his have suppressed and abolished all precedent histories, making their writings to be before all others, thereby to authorize them the better. Yet we will leave those their calumnies to the judgment of any of sound sense and understanding, if that could be, or can have any place or shadow of belief amongst men of sound judgment or reasonable discourse. For if they will put into mature consideration the small means and contemptible quality in the world of these poor Israelites, but shepherds and breeders of Catel, and, which is worse, people exposed to the oppressions and hard servitude under their puissant enemies and evil-disposed neighbors. Then who shall make comparison of them with great kings and people of the earth, Babylonians, Egyptians, Syrians, Romans, and other potentates, who with all their authority, their edicts, forces, and armies, had never power to abolish the holy books, 
written simply by our poor shepherds, when they could not conserve their royal libraries, favoured of all the world. Truly, this may well put to the blush these wiselings, that show themselves fools in so speaking, and discoursing without discourse, and will judge of things without inquiry. Now for the integrity of Moses, for us Christians, we are sufficiently cleared and satisfied by the authority of the Holy Spirit of God, who hath given excellent testimony by all the Scriptures, both in the Old and New Testament, of his original and lineage, being descended from the latter Levi, nephew of the holy patriarch Abraham, also of his miraculous conservation and deliverance from death and waters, from whence he was drawn forth, and then had that name of Moses in their language, then his royal education and breeding, his love to his afflicted people, and his magnanimity to despise humane greatness, in preferring the just cause and sufferance of Christ, the Redeemer then looked for, before all the regal estate and great treasure of Egypt. Moreover, his sufferance long and bitter, for the defense of right and equity, and for the deliverance of the poor afflicted, his divine calling to the charge and government of his people, his patience, gentleness, and perseverance with such faithfulness, in the difficult execution of this weighty charge, and the singular gift of prophecy, and of his divine miracles so strange and supernatural, that they have been admired and celebrated of all the whole world. But there is one point above all, very remarkable, and which is more than sufficient to overcome humane reason, and to show the integrity of Moses, which is, that if he had wood, he might easily, and according to the manner of men, have had the monarchy and domination for his children, and their posterity, upon all the people of Israel. And with the same, the two fertile kingdoms, reduced under his hand, and conquered beyond Jordan. Nevertheless, he left his sons, Jersom and Eliezer, and their posterity, private men, and of most simple estate, amongst the other Levites, and the same children remaining subject to the sacrifices, successors of Aaron, and to the magistrates and governors of Israel. More, that he hath himself written, and enregistered his own proper faults, and yet more notable, those of his house, as of his brother, sister, and nephews, and the most remarkable judgments of God's chastisements and punishments of them all. Of which things, all his people were witnesses, in number more than six hundred thousand persons, and if they could have contraried him for any falsity, either for the present or times to come. If he had been, I say, such as they could have found any brack in his actions, or in his writings, or falseness in either his person, or any of his, in his life, and his miracles, in his writings or end. But on the contrary, all the Hebrews and Jews, which have been since that time, and are now near three thousand years since, and that are dispersed through all the world, who are in so great a number, that if they were reunited into a body of people, and into a state, their multitude should be innumerable, and might astonish the greatest nation of the whole universe. All those, I say, have received from their ancient fathers, from their kings and princes, and their sacrificators and ancestors, from father to son, and from hand to hand, and with an admirable consent, even in the middle of so many confusions and dissipations, have kept, and yet keep always in their Bibles, the holy writings of Moses in their proper letters and Hebrew tongue, as books most true and veritable, sacred and divine, and such so known and acknowledged in all nations with the excellent testimony, authority and holiness of them, that Christ himself hath spoken of them, and the prophets and apostles also in their writings and allegations, I, and the most ancient pagans and strangers, cannot with sound sense but acknowledge them. And so, reader, although I have been, as I formerly said, something prolix, yet the excellency of the subject forced and bound me to be so tedious herein, to show, as an illustrious addition, the worthiness of the books and divine writings, as their antiquity, dignity, as also the excellency of their humane writer, from the dictate of the Most High. And being the matter whereof we have formerly treated, I held it not impertinent, though I have dealt too weakly in so worthy a business, but refer the rest in it to your charitable censure. Fiendness.